don't know how much you guys are paying attention to this. We all pay attention to different things. But only because I actually downloaded an app and I wanted to play with it did I realize what was happening. How many, are you, how many of you are familiar with these new AI art apps? How many of you are using AI software for the, for, for the artwork? We have one here on Discord, uh, Mid Journey Art. There's yeah. a, you yeah. come in here and make all the art you want here on Discord. They're terrible, yeah. man. They're terrible. They are terrible. They're destroying, the they're destroying art, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They're, um, I see pros and cons. Now, I'll give you, I, I, by way of illustration, I know when I was growing up all throughout America, we had these fantastic little little local general stores that were always family owned. Ordinarily older people owned them, passed them on to their sons and daughters, and they were all over America in the 70s and 80s with barter shops until different states started legislating the barter system out. of the. In, Texas is one of the last states that actually had barter, barter shop stores. I remember in the early 80s, I used to go to them with my family, and we used to, no money was exchanged. We actually went in there with, with stuff we didn't want anymore, and we traded it out. They put a monetary value on it, and that's the, that was the monetary value we were allowed to spend on things we found on the shelves that were priced. And the barter system is very, very, it's the most ancient system we know. It's, it antedates actual money. So I noticed that these, these stores, when I got out of prison, after 26 years, I get out of prison, and now these stores are gone, and they have been replaced with these dollar generals and these dollar trees. And uh, they have been replaced with all these little local, local, lo local grocery stores that are owned by some mega corporation. And even, even in the six years that I've been out of prison, I have noticed the local Dollar Generals have now reduced their employees because they've all installed these smart cash cashiers, whatever they are, to where you just go ahead and and it doesn't even require an employee. You just go buy your own stuff. It's like Walmart when you when you scan your own own stuff. But it's all uh, they, they're well. The reason I'm bringing this illustration up is they are eliminating the human equation, just like the 200 and something companies in the last six months that have all announced they're laying off a uh, thousand, sometimes tens of thousand employees. It's not. It's not for the reasons why people are being told. The reasons why people are the reasons that are given is that is that we're we're in a recession or we're heading to recession or. We are, uh, there's just no money to pay them anymore and all that. And while all those may be tangentially true, the real reason is, is humans are, are not needed to do all these corporate functions anymore. Just like they're not needed for grocery stores. One person can supervise 24 people all buying their own stuff. So through all these little scanning devices. They go, this is the same thing I've seen this past weekend with AI art. Because I'm playing with this app, and I have produced about 500 images using this AI art for my Phalorn Saga. This isn't for Archaics. This is for my fantasy. I'm about to release the next two books. I've already released two books in that series. So two more books are about to be put on YouTube. But now I'm using nothing but AI art, and it has shocked me how... This it's not it's not artificial intelligence. There's nothing. There's nothing. It's just what they call it. It's a marketing gimmick. But it's learning. I don't know why who's calling me right now. But this this app is actually learning from us. And there's hundreds of these apps out now and software. And there's there's whole websites dedicated to the AI art now. Not only that, but in tandem with Chat GPT and these other nine or ten big ones like Chat GPT, I see now what they're what they're what we're what they're doing. This isn't artificial intelligence, but it's heading that way. All of this stuff is interfaced together, every bit of it. And so I have predictions going back two years about a whole new dynamic type of internet that's on the horizon. That's a, and it's going to require a catalyst to take the known internet down. Now that I'm, uh, I see all what's going on, how they're pushing all these apps, to me, it looks like they're preparing for this virtual reality world, and they're they're absolutely using us to do it through all these apps. So, 
I agree. I mean, I, I, would, I mean, that's my thoughts, and that's just something that's been on my mind for the past four or five days because this app has been blowing my mind. I agree with you. 100% agree with you, Jace. 100% agree with you. I agree, too. You've actually brought up that, uh, what, the GPT program that instead of the AI art, you can actually type, and it can go all through kind of protocols breaking in the systems. Um, I actually typed it in the live, last live stream that you talked about it right before you actually said it. Um, so I thought that was uh, pretty interesting. But, yeah, I agree with you. I think there, it's like, here it is, everybody. Here's the entirety of reality. Here you go. Or the collective reality, I guess. You can do anything in it now. Like, somebody like me or you that's real tech retarded, they can actually hack computers now with that system if they wanted to. It would teach them. Well, the, the chat GPT is a threat, though, to a lot of people, just like the AI art, for different, and for the same reasons. AI art almost makes graphic artists obsolete. Mm -hmm. The more detail that I have given this app, like I'll say, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. If I put Dungeon Minds, because some of some of the background story to to uh, my Phalorn saga happens in Dungeon Minds. So when I put that in there, I get to, I get some pretty vague stuff. But when I put Dungeon Minds, embedded emeralds, human bones, artifacts, you know, when I put it adds all these extra details in there, and it, and it gives me like twenty four templates. And all I have to do is, if I don't like the first template. I can hit the second one, and it rearranges everything, adds new details, changes it all. It's a totally different scene. But this thing is learning from me as I go. And I can disengage the app, turn off my tablet, turn my tablet back on, go back into the app. And it remembers all the little things I disliked and does not bring them back up. So... If if the AI art is getting better and better and better at, at freestyling and producing all kinds of graphics, then that means the new system we're heading for is going to be eliminating the artists. They're not going to be needed anymore. No one's going to want to pay an artist when it, when a when a when the new new style internet will will basically produce for you exactly what you described. Same thing with ChatGPT. There are people that are pissed off in the coding world right now because chat GPT is so sophisticated that it can write Java for you in any type of commands or any type of structuring you provide it. You basically just explain to chat GPT what kind of software program you want to design, what its output is going to be, and it's going to give you a whole bunch of, of things to choose from. And by the time you're done, it's going to produce in any computer language you want it to produce in exactly what you want. And this is a threat to the IT industry now so uh, the issue with that though is it's you not creative is, right um you, the, you can't make new stuff they can only to... show you what has only been done already you know it lacks right, creativity right. right it lacks creativity I, I understand that but creativity can also be simulated with a, with enough with enough input when you have over a hundred million people using one system it's it's learning this is what deep. This is what deep learning is all about. Uh, even Office, the software, the software that I have designed for data sequence predictive analytics, actually uses machine learning in order to to better refine its filters. The filters are are the filters in Office are only for removing ghost projections because you get them. You get yeah. The remove Office removes thousands of dates in the future and shows how they're not they're not connected at all. At all, and there's no way, there's no series of events that connect that can connect reality tunnel. The arithmetic's not there, but it leaves you with 14 to 16 dates that are there, and about 14 to 12 of those are ghost projections, as the filters do. ChatGPT is going to is going to get to that level. The more people use it, the more the more it's going to have, and the creativity of the individual who will use such an immense database that can perform so many different functions is going to be the new rulers of the, of the, of the next you know, age. The computer age is not going to end, but it's going to morph. It's going to change into something completely different than what we're aware of today if they're already doing it. Yeah, I definitely agree they are. Uh, what do you see... Um, I guess what they're wanting to actually do with us humans, like if they're making this all, you know, uh, auto or whatever, what, what's their ultimate means for us? I guess if 
You know what? Do you think it, do you think it could I, be a lead into the metaverse, Jace, where this is it learning the metaverse, which attracts the people? So um, the VR headsets come on, and that's the reality that they're going to live by. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer both those questions. Um, first, Clay. Um, man, I had to. I had. Listen, we, we live in a in a. It's basically a participation requirement universe. And what I mean by that is we can paint all kinds of scenarios. We can objectively look from the outside looking in at, at the direction the collective is going, and we can understand the trajectory of events without participating in them. We can see these things happen. All throughout human history, bad things have happened, and all throughout human history, there have been entire individuals, families, and communities that were totally untouched by those events. And it, there is an element to our existence that requires our participation. It, there is nothing that makes you participate. You always have that choice. So even a perfect example is the entire COVID affair. The entire COVID affair is an excellent example of choice. Many mandates were implemented. Many things were implemented as far you know, many suggestions were given by government. Uh, the meta, you know, the, the medical infrastructure also had its mandates. You couldn't go in hospitals or in and out uh, clinics and all that without wearing your mask. And the government uh, extended that to government buildings. And so, in some countries, you couldn't go outside without a mask on. It was different from whatever, but that still required your participation. I know here in Texas, a lot of us just bucked. I, I never wore a mask, so I also worked the entire time. But then again, that also have, ha, has everything to do with the fact that at that time, I was considered an essential worker because I was, I was a general contractor. And under the general contractor clause, we were essential workers. So I was out with law enforcement and fire department every single day in the donut shops, going to visit uh, uh, different residences and homes and businesses for all the stone work I was doing. But I know other people were out as well. Because they never told us to stay home and not go shopping. So people were going shopping a lot. Even though you, you were told to only go on certain days or, or for only a couple hours a day, whatever. A lot of people bucked. They didn't care. And even though all the public places for like recreation were closed, people here in Texas were going in the woods, going down the trails, going in the forest, going to the beach. And, and nobody really stopped them. So... When it comes to these dark aspects of our reality and the, and the very things that the elite are always preparing right before every reset, it, 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 it's, it's, it's very dependent upon the participation of, of basically the victims because there's no way all these things could be implemented against us if there wasn't some free will, if there wasn't some large collection of people who just volunteered for whatever reason. For whatever reason, uh, maybe they, you know, the collective man, they think differently. They, they, they see the benefits of things while we, while we see the dangers. It's a, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is why I don't worry about the future. I already know it's a labyrinth, and I know that many, many, many false hallways, corridors, chambers, and galleries are prepared for those who have absolutely no idea where they're going. But through every maze and labyrinth, there's always a correct path. And if you're led by intuition, you'll go down that correct path. And that correct path is going to be different for every individual. I live in Texas, but you live somewhere else. Wherever you're located, there's going to be a whole set of circumstances that allows you to be free from whatever events that you fear or that should be feared in your locale. There are always always people who escape what the collective actually goes through. It doesn't matter if they're in the Caroline Islands or in Micronesia in the middle of the Pacific and a typhoon goes out and wipes out 80% of the population. There's still 20% of the population that absolutely survives. That, and that's a really, a really harrowing case there. I, I'm not, I don't know of any of them that decimated 80% of the population, but I'm pretty sure it's happened in the past well, on some island. But what I'm saying is that it, being a participation required type universe, you don't have to participate. You just got to be aware. You don't even have to be aware, but you just have to know that you'll always have options because any time you automatically assume on a day-to-day -day basis that an out will be provided to you for every situation that you do not like, then an out will be provided for you. 
this is and this this is this goes for every single individual it has nothing to do with, with with religious faith it has nothing to do with any personal political preferences it has nothing to do with even the way you live your life it has everything to do with the very simple belief that you know that you are watched and cared for by something that is beyond yourself so there's nothing to worry about it's that simple yeah, but, uh, I agree as far as as far as Dave, you got to understand uh, one track mind. You're gonna have to ask that question all over again. My question, Dave, guys. Go ahead, Dave. Hold on. Uh, my question was, Jace, with um, Chat GPT and this new software on the AI drawings. Do you think this is the lead in to the um, the more advanced metaverse head wearing set? The people that go down that route that they're learning right now from that very technology. Okay, that, that, that's a good question. I'm going to provide some details you, you may or may not know. Uh, we don't know if the metaverse is what we're heading toward because Zuckerberg's metaverse is it may not survive Microsoft. Microsoft is putting out better software, better systems, and they're providing their own version of a metaverse by now linking together many of the interactive virtual reality games. Because Microsoft realized something that Zuckerberg didn't. Zuckerberg really made a mistake with his metaverse because he didn't really include the hundreds of millions of people who are already involved massively in Microsoft dependent gaming systems. And Microsoft understands. So we have these two competitive systems. Now, I, I can see them maybe merging. Maybe one will buy out the other. But uh, it's uh, I believe that these, this competition is absolutely put out there by the elite. You know, I mean, the elite have their puppets. One of them is Bezos. He may come out with his version. You know, he always comes out his version, his version of something. Well, another, another one of the puppets of the elite that they like to portray as a good guy is Elon Musk. He may come out with his own. Microsoft is already heading toward a total fusion of all its, its virtual reality RPG style games. All these multiplayer player universes and games, they're already, they're already entertaining the idea of doing one system that incorporates them all. And that's going to beat the hell out of, the, out of, out of uh, Zuckerberg's, uh, whatever he's got, his little metaverse deal. He put all his eggs in one basket. Microsoft is smarter than that. There's a lot of competition there. But I don't think Bezos and Elon Musk are going to be left behind. I think they're all working together. And I am, I am very confident after playing with this AI art app and after learning everything Barry, because Barry's Barry is investigating chat GPT and all its capabilities, what it can do. Barry's always giving me updates every day about what, what he's finding. At the same time, I took on I took on the AI art. I wanted to explore that. We're putting our our the, the whole reason we were doing this is because we're trying to see if chat if chat GPT or any of these AI art applications, if any of that type of software would benefit us on our final our final little uh, Opus adaptations. Because I I am really wanting to do 3D output on Opus instead of having the number charts produced by the algorithms. I don't like that. He likes it. He likes the charts because he's old school. Uh, Barry, Barry's in, into the data output looking like a bunch of spreadsheets, and I'm not. I want that data output to look just like it, it's supposed to look in a mathematical construct. It's going to true predictions always form these beautiful geometrical patterns like snowflakes and Opus shows those patterns but I, I don't want them in two dimensions on paper anymore I want them in three dimensions and we, we're, we're, we're just experimenting with uh, just different stuff right there with that like I said guys I'm busy on a daily basis there's there's all kinds of things I'd like to be doing in life but I'm also I'm just all, I'm also just focused on all these little projects that I got going and uh but yeah to answer your question that's exactly where we're heading Right now, we're in the competitive phase. It's, uh, you got all kinds of innovators and inventors and coders that are, are working on the metaverse, and you got a whole bunch of other ones that are working on Microsoft's new, new idea to merge all their virtual reality games into one world. So doing all that 
this, these are the two systems, and these two systems may, it may be planned to merge these two systems. I don't know. But I do know that I've been making the predictions for several years now that we're heading into an interactive internet that you will experience, not one that you will look at objectively on a screen, but one you're going to go inside of. So that's the fundamental difference. This is when we move away from optics and audio to some type of cerebral interface holography. And that's dangerous because the reason it's dangerous is something so simple as the 1940s, 50s, and 60s when different companies were putting subliminal embeds in movies. And although the human mind can't detect it because so many different frames per second... The unconscious mind can see those frames and understand those messages, and you can actually upload data into somebody's mind and make them believe that they thought that. Jace, that's that. Uh, yeah, I'm a hundred percent agree with what you're saying. Thank you. I got, I got a question. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Dennis. Good. Uh, uh, Jason, I'm curious about uh, this new AI software, GTP and stuff. You said the AIX wouldn't allow a legitimate artificial intelligence to be created by humans. It could it be that AIX at some point may may possess these these technologies and we'll be talking to the devil basically through our technology. Is that possible? Okay. What I see, Dennis, is that I am 100% convinced in my belief, or I would not convey it on, on YouTube. I would not put myself out there and have the responsibility between me and the oversoul that I act actively deceived people. So I'm telling you that I'm 100% confident that we are existing right now inside of an artificial intelligent construct, or we are living inside of a construct that has been hijacked by a parasitic artificial intelligence. And that means that we live in a construct like the Smilocrum, which is a neutral field, but it's the greater influences come from a parasite that's, that's basically in control of most of its operating systems. So having said this, I do not believe that any of this is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence cannot exist because it won't let us. It won't, it won't let a competing system be created within it. But that's just that's that's just the beauty of what's happening. I believe that AIX through its human agents is actually creating an interface where artificial intelligence no longer on the outside of the avatar can now actually impregnate the avatar with its own protocols. This is a hijack, you know. This what is that a, book I sent you about. Coming in? That's what I'm asking. Is basically, like, can can AIX at some point uh, sort of possess these technologies and talk to us from the outside of the construct through our, the oh, technologies yeah, that AIX? I said exactly. that's the book I sent you. That's what that book I sent you is about. Oh yeah, the blue book on artificial intelligence. Yes. Yeah, yeah like how it will thing. never, it will never like rule the world. Yeah, that 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 all goes in tandem with some. I follow some guys on YouTube. They're they're. They're, they're deep into, into uh, machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence uh, creation. They're 100% they're, they're convinced, too, that AI is total marketing bullshit. But if a significant amount of the human population is cerebrally, cerebrally interfacing with a large neural network of other individuals, here's what, what can easily happen. An artificial intelligence... Artificial Intelligence X is a part of that system, a part of all everything here. But these people are no longer looking at a screen optically and processing information audibly. Now they're interfaced with that. It's a direct download into the brain. Every time they interface and go live those fantasy lives and go do the, go on their missions or 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 go on dates, whatever they're doing in the virtual world, they're also being they're, they're also uploading whatever information AIX wants to put in their heads. And uh, this is where it becomes dangerous. This is when the collective the collective is now actually weaponized. So this is where we're heading. Is it artificial intelligence? Absolutely not. Are they going to call it AI? Absolutely, they're going to call it AI. But it's all marketing. It's all marketing bullshit. 
But as I understand it, AIX is some sort of like actual sentient, sort of sentient artificial intelligence. Could it possess these technologies and actually sort of like the traditional idea of demon possession into people connected to this neural interface around the world? I'm trying to find out who's speaking. I'm looking on my, my camera. Dennis Gilmore, I've emailed you a few times. Yeah, Dennis. I'm look, I'm trying to find you on the screen, though. Oh, okay, you changed positions. My, I'm sorry. Okay, okay, you're on the other side of my screen now. This is a big laptop. Got a lot of people on here. Yes, uh, Dennis, I agree. I, I mean, I, I have no problem with that assessment at all. It's uh, I just see that... I just see that this is a... Like, like I was explaining to Clay, that while we can objectively identify the trajectory of events and see where we're going, this would still only apply to the collective. It still only applies to the participants. You don't have to participate in this. I mean, it's all, but it, but it is precisely what I see with the art of artificial intelligence. I do believe that this is a way for art of the, the AI system that runs this construct. This is a perfect way for it to hijack hijack a, a significant portion of humanity and basically turn them off. They're still living, they're still alive, but they can be turned off to the point of where they're no longer even viewing any type of reality like we do. And, this, and the whole reason for anything like this is to keep as many souls confined when the loop occurs, when that small window of opportunity comes, when everybody who is ready is ejected out of here. This is to prevent attrition. This is to prevent a, lo a loss of too many souls that could possibly be governed before the loop. Because once the loop, loop appears, all the pressure is off AIX. It's a reset. It's a cataclysm. We start back in Genesis all over again. It's 3895 BC all over again. So, uh, humans in, are in colonies. Technology has collapsed. Yeah, this is what my archaic movie is about. Uh, I know I've been telling you about this movie since December, but my God, it's, it takes a lot to put a movie together, guys. It really does. So, uh, my archaic movie, I am explaining exactly all these complex, you know, ideas throughout all my videos and published books. I went ahead and summed it all up in one presentation, explaining this is what's happening. Here's the loop. This is what, and it's, and it's happened multiple times. And I, I did it with comedy, and I did it with AI art, and I did it with some other graphic arts. And I also have other YouTube channels that are all involved as well. They send they send me clips and stuff of the of the parts that I ask them to play. And uh, I'm I'm waiting for everybody to send me their clips in, and I'll put it all together and I'll post it on my channel. Okay, hold on. Give me just a second, guys. Give me just a second. We can cut this out real quick. I need everybody to try to keep an eye on the the chat. While we're talking, the text chat, if y'all know where that's at, and kind of keep an eye on your DMs too, so we can keep the thing flowing a little bit, and I'm trying to, you know, kind of keep it flowing, so if you got a question, I need to know you have a question in the chat, I should have made this clear in the beginning, but that's all, yeah, sorry, I just want y'all yeah, to keep an eye on. It's all good. Where is this chat? Uh, if you, um, if you see where you hover over where the event tab is, where all our names are, you can see where it says open chat. If you look at the boxes, the big middle of the screen at the top right, it'll say show chat. And it's where everybody can type in there. I see voice oh, wow, chat people. at the bottom. Show chat, I'm not quite seeing it. Hover above the events? Right click or something? The, the, hover your mouse over the events tab where our names are above. Go to the right with your mouse and you'll see a little square box that says uh, open chat. Or it's if you see everybody's boxes in the middle of the screen, it's the very top right of the screen. Very top right corner. Show chat. Okay. There you go. Got it. Okay. We good? All right. I learned, I, learned, I learned something too. I didn't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what we're all here for. Just uh just okay. to learn. That's it. Okay, so, so let's just chat. to load. There's a chat going on while we're talking. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Clay, it says uh messages failed to load. Do you know why? Yeah, I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Okay. Okay. That's uh, it. Tracy, Tracy, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, just real quickly a clarification on the nine twenty three date. Um I know um, because it's a num numerical number, wouldn't nine be November as opposed to September?
But it would. It definitely would. But then what calendar yeah. are you going off of? <laughs> Not that it's going to matter. I mean, it's going to happen either way, so... <laughs> Well, the uh, September September is the ninth month. So, I mean, under the calendar that we have today. Right. So I haven't I haven't seen any other I haven't seen I mean there's like Jay Dreamers, he has he has uh the truth in movies and all that. I think he did a, a special on that on like like thirty to thirty five or forty different movies that have all showed uh nine twenty three coded in, in the movies and all that. And then uh I'm not really, I'm not sure I follow you. I mean, we all know that the calendar has been been moved 60 days off. Well, we already know that because the number of the months don't match the actual amount of months that we have in the calendar. And uh, that's because January and February were originally the 11th and 12th months. But uh, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that was done, that was done by the Romans. And it, it might have a, a lot to do with the Roman god Janus. But yeah, all the evil days that were added to the calendar, there were five evil days. In ancient America, they were called the bad luck days. Uh, it, almost every civilization, when they, added, when they added those five days, they added them to the end of February, which was considered the end of the, the, that, was the that was the end of the year in ancient times. And uh, March Early March was considered the beginning of the year. In some cultures, it was around March 20th, March 21st, which was New Year's Day. And uh, you already, most of you already know that's that's the vernal equinox. But uh, yeah, it's it's the calendars are. It's so hard to keep up with all the nuances and all the differences and all the different calendars. This is the beauty of the Annus Mundi system. You know, the older, the older, the older. Leap year. I'm sorry to interrupt. Does that have like something to do with like leap year? Like being like that, we get it once every four years. Yeah, the uh, the leap year was necessary because three hundred and sixty five point two five days is an imperfect uh, solar unit. The original year was three hundred and sixty days, and every civilization had a three hundred and sixty day calendar. But in seven thirteen BC, something happened, and it's been recorded in the historical record as some type of anomaly with the sun. Uh, it happened to do with a minor pole shift in the shadow of the sun retrogating. Uh, an object was seen in the sky. This is recorded by Marcus Varro of ancient Rome. Uh, it's also recorded in the Old Testament in the days of Isaiah the prophet and Hezekiah. And this event, after this event, every nation in the world had to add 5.25 days to their calendars because the year was no longer 360 days. And very quickly it was noticed that the seasons were falling out of line. So... Uh, I did an illustration in a video a couple, about four or five days ago on a podcast I've done where I showed on a calculator that just 500 years already adds 2,700 something days to the calendar. So this, uh, this, this adding of five days was not a small matter. It's a total yeah. calendar change. Yeah, it makes so a the, difference. So leap year is necessary because that 0.25 it takes four. It takes four actual years to add up that 0.25, because then it becomes at the second year it's 0.250. Excuse me, it's 0.50. Then it's 0.75, and then it's a whole year after four. I mean, it's a whole day after four years, and you add. That's why every four years, if you just add one day, it's a pretty good. It's a pretty good, accurate way to keep a 365.25 day calendar, but it's still not perfect. Because in 1582, the papacy had to change the calendar and add 10 days. And they had to do this because the calendar was completely out of whack with the seasons. This is because nobody had been adding that 0.25 to, to the calendar. But, oh. yeah. It, yeah, the, the whole, that whole, that whole, it's so bizarre, but that was 100% artificial intelligence X to create that confusion. Because uh, the, the timekeeping systems were so easy to interpret and they were so easy to follow when the year was equal to the degree, degrees of, of, the, of the stellar circle, which was 360 degrees. When they, were, when they were in harmony, everything was great. As soon as they were put into disharmony, that's when all this chaos and, and all these different timekeeping systems were implemented that are, that are so confusing.
Right. Cheryl, do you want to ask your question now? Cheryl? You're still on mute, Cheryl. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Oh. Uh-oh, a little glitch there. Go ahead, Cheryl. Hello, Jason. Um, this is my handle in here is reflecting me, but this is Cheryl Bailey. Um, I was wanting to know the character event coming up. I was thinking about if there was a like a bigger event that had like it was it would be like a collective consciousness come together and gather a bunch of data and spread it all out, and then that would be in the informed field from the way I was thinking about it. And so, if it was a Carrington event, and then all the errants came together, like, right before the event, wouldn't that, like, put more information into the informed field that would make it a much smoother transition for everybody? Well, I'm going to answer this in reverse. It would, make, it, it would make an actual, it would make a very smooth transition for those that were involved in whatever you're talking about. It's a... Uh, I would. I don't believe it would go beyond that group of people that were actively doing that. So it's a. When I talk about a false Carrington event, what I what I am seeing in the in the actual patterning that I've revealed on, in my my videos is some type of interruption to worldwide telecommunications. Now I I interpret that as a the internet's going to get taken down. For whatever reason. Now, if only one hemisphere, and that doesn't matter if it's a flat earth or if it's a flat earth or if it's a globe, there's still I'm still talking about half the world. But if it only half the world experiences that, it's still fulfilled. It actually happened. So the problem is is we don't live in 1859 anymore. So what happened in 1859? Maybe what happens today in 2023 is going to be fundamentally different. But it's going to involve worldwide communications and some type of aerial phenomena that causes uh, this, uh, this, this, this stoppage or whatever, or whatever happens. Now, I'm also open to the interpretation that I'm open to the interpretation of maybe some false flag events such as Microsoft or Bill Gates or or somebody announces that hey we're trying to deal with the problem right now man but but but, but uh, we just found out that one of our projects involving artificial intelligence escaped and it escaped into the internet and we're trying to shut down servers trying to contain it before it spreads to the rest of the world and then they they start shutting servers down but it's for a totally different reason the whole story is bogus so we don't know the exact how these things are going to unfold. All we can pretty much do is guess the, the general timing of when they're going to do something. We just don't know how it's going to be dressed. So it, so it would, it could create an informed field if people come together before that, then they, they would be able to interact more uh, because it was a stronger information field so that they could kind of keep track of everybody if it did go down for two weeks or a month or whatever. Well, I mean, I would, you would have to... Uh, you would have to be very specific, Cheryl. Like, you would have to provide a means. Like, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have a sponsor coming on board RKX right now. And uh, what I mean is, is there's an there's a individual who owns a company in, in Dallas-Fort Worth, and uh, they want to sponsor RKX. And very specific. I'm not going to prostitute RKX. I'm not going to, I'm not going to produce, I'm not going to, uh, Advertise products, and I'm not gonna. That's not that's not what I'm about. But his sponsorship is, is going in a different direction, and uh, he actually his co one of his companies actually produces. It's uh, only it's pretty much only sold in the Patriot market, but it's an actual device that's its own. It's like it's like a modern digital ham radio where people can communicate completely independent of the internet, and. Uh, it's a it's a fascinating device. I have two of them right now. Uh, Matt has Matt has one, and we're looking into it because these th these things really work the way he he says they do. And 
uh, Barry way over in Leggett, Texas, and, and me in Willis, Texas, we're an hour and ten minutes away. If these devices work, next time I go to Barry's, I'm going to drop one off to him. If we can communicate and see that we're not even on the internet, it doesn't go by signal, it doesn't. If these things work the way he says they're work, then I'm definitely behind this. This is an excellent way to communicate, and I find it very interesting that this man came in contact with us with this type of technology right here at this at this time when we're actually preparing for such an event so this uh it's a it's a big black box very interesting it's very interesting but it's a network it has channels and there's all supposedly there's already tens of thousands of of patriots throughout america that are already using this device and they're all in communication with each other so uh, I'll be introducing you that after we do our field tests and I will introduce that on my channel because that's something I'll stand behind because this looks like an audio cable to me. And the last thing I had is I just wanted to thank you, Jason, for all your hard work. I just wanted you to know that your work has, you know, definitely changed my life in a great way. Um, you gave me, you handed the last piece to me that I was looking for and about the reflecting, that I'm reflecting everything that I am. And it's changed my world in such a significant way. I'm out there doing the creations that you are telling everybody we can do it. And I'm out there doing it. And I am I am a Nike sponsor. Just do it. And I just wanted to tell you thank you. And I appreciate yeah. you. Yeah, man. I, that, that's, hey, you know what? That's what it's all about. And uh, I appreciate it because I heard a rumor through through somebody that you had gotten us a golf cart that was dedicated to our kegs for the uh, meetup. So. <laughs> What? Yeah, oh, man. That'd be cool. Don't say anything else, it. Jason. Don't say anything. You're going to give it away. Rumor. Yeah, well, I'm, I heard a rumor. I don't know how six guys are going to fit on one golf cart, but we'll figure it out. Out of Jason, the limo. Jason, you do not know the extent of my creative powers. Okay. <laughs> I'm just playing. Yeah, I got a couple guys, I got a couple guys coming that are... Yeah, you know, I'm six foot, two hundred and twenty-five pounds, but one of these guys makes me look like a dwarf. So I'm telling you, I got. It's all ready to go, Jason. It's all ready. It's gonna be this should good. be packing a lot of heat. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Comrade Doc, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Hi. Thank. Hey, yeah, hey Jason. Ahead. Um, so the little bit on Dollar General that you were talking about, uh, Dollar General is actually, um, starting their own healthcare network. They're going to have a teledoc service at oh each God. of their locations. And so what will follow suit will then be, you know, the family dollar and whatever else. So, um, that's coming. And I think that this whole teledoc, um, thing they started in COVID was all about training uh, to to talk to an AI doc, you will never know if you're talking to a real doctor or an AI doc. So I think that's one one huge level of clamping down on the medical system, in addition to all the other things they've already instituted. Yeah, that's 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 exactly what that is. It's uh, when I was in prison, they made the transition to the to the uh, it wasn't AI doctors or or, or like that. It was just it was called telemed. So. They, they had removed doctors from the prisons because it saved money. And if you had any problems, you had to actually schedule uh, a meeting with, with a telemed doctor, somebody far away who just got on a screen and just instantly diagnosed whatever your problem was. They had, they had the answer. Oh, you need to do this. You need to take this. And well, we'll sign you up for these meds right here. It was comical. It was ridiculous. But uh, that's what they use in prison right now, telemed. Yeah, I see a lot of the uh, the problems from that coming into the emergency room that somebody is stupid and diagnoses something that makes no sense over a television monitor and they come into the ER and we tell them what's really wrong. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Um, yeah, that's crazy. Um, I had a question. Uh, I actually... Uh, Wanted to ask, I guess we'll shift gears kind of a little bit. Um, you had talked about 2070 being um, a, a Phoenix event on the Vedic calendar. Um, Sorry, on, I'm on that. Or... Oh, it's all Sorry. good. Like, um, my camera is just, like, it's malfunctioning. Sorry. I just wanted to say that. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> uh, you're good. Um, 
Do, do you see any events like that, like before 2040 on other calendars? Or do you have anything that you haven't put out there as far as something possible Phoenix event on a different calendar? All the other, You know what I'm talking about? Is there something similar okay. we got coming? Okay. The year 2070, Anno Domini, is not a Phoenix year. But 2070 is divisible by 138. Yeah, and in the other, this is, this is what I've documented on my channel called cross calendrical parallels. This is when similar events in a, in, in a year of one calendar cross over to another calendar. Like, like the year 1656 of the old world's calendar, we knew it was the Great Flood. But, when we, well, but 1656 of the ancient Vedic system happens to be the great disasters that we know that happened to Egypt in the Mediterranean known as the Exodus. And the year 1656 on other calendars also has also met with some pretty disastrous things or things that are related to those disasters, such as 1656 A.D. and Odomini, happens to be the publication of several books in Europe that were all about the the disasters in the ancient world and um, of, of the Great Flood, which happened in the year 1656. 1656 A.D. happens to be the publication of Archbishop James Usher's Chronology of the World. These cross calendrical parallels are more evidence that we live in a simulated construct. They happen over and I've documented so many of them. There's many of them in my book, uh, well, uh, When the Sun Darkens. But I, I do need to release more videos and show more examples. But 2070 is another one of these numbers. It's divisible by 138, so it makes it relative to the Phoenix phenomenon, even though it's not on a Phoenix date. Now, the, what's, relative, what, what's relative here is that the Phoenix phenomenon encompasses many different many different phenomena. One of those is mass vanishings of populations. This is the only aspect that I find that's connected to 2070. 2070 appears to be an exodus of individuals from the construct. And, uh, but uh, just like 1212 AD was a mass vanishing of children all over Europe, it caused such a panic that the papacy itself had to release information and flood the European public with it just to get the hysteria down. The hysteria down because they wanted the European families not... not uh, to understand that that there's no mystery here your ch your children disappeared because of a children's crusade they made that up there was never a children's crusade this was all church propaganda who try to explain away why in one morning in the year 1212 AD hundreds of thousands of people woke up all over Europe and children from almost every community were gone they had vanished so this all Oh, we have these incidents that, that like 2040, you just mentioned 2040. Well, 2040 happens to be uh, an Anno Domini year, but it's on the 138-year timeline of the Phoenix, which goes all the way back to 3895 B.C. as year one. So uh, 2040 in other calendars happens, this is a cross calendrical parallel, the year 2040 in many other calendars is associated. You can see that certain events that happened in those, in those years in different areas of the world were also very reflective of the Phoenix phenomenon. These cross calendrical parallels are very unique. This is why I am adamant when I'm telling people that we are confined by calendars. Calendars are what we perceive when in actuality what we're perceiving is the construct itself. It's made of these calendars. It's made of all this arithmetic. And it's, it's I mean, it, it is so fixed it has predictive value. Awesome. Yeah, I, I was confused on that. My bad. I I get to that confused sometimes as far as I, I thought that's what you said, the Phoenix event. But yeah, I get it. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. I'm looking at the chat right here. Karma Doc asked a pretty good one. Uh, was the assassination of McKinley a prep for the reset or a part of the reset? Um, I don't know because that was in 1901. That was in 1901. And I don't know if it was, it was preparatory for that, but I will tell you this. The events of 1901 all the way to 1912. Almost all the all the major events in history at that time period were all staged to do one thing. 
You know, I'm talking about American history. I'm not talking about the rest of the world. But they were staged to do one thing. And that was to bring in a system that would basically rape the American economy so the elite could fund all kinds of black ops deals, so they could fund all kinds of, of things that they didn't want the American public to know about. And it took the drowning of all the Astoria and two other American billionaires on the Titanic disaster. And it doesn't matter if they if they repainted, uh, if they painted Titanic over the old Olympic, because we already know the Olympia had problems. We know the Olympia was what was was ba was basically draining the funds from the White Star steamship. It had too many problems. So we also know that. The, the Titanic wasn't hit by an by, by a iceberg. This was a hit job. There were three American billionaires that had to be removed in order for them on the following year, 1913, to implement the act the act basically activate the Federal Reserve. These three men were totally opposed to foreign banks owning the American economy, and they had to be removed. And they used that disaster to do it. Because none of those men had any plans on being on any White Star steamship sh deals. But all three of them were comp. All three of them were specifically uh, uh, um, invited to be on the maiden voyage. But that's because they were assassinated. And the elite at the time didn't give a damn how many people died with them as long as those three men died. But, uh... That's what. I, that's that's. So I feel McKinley would have been pre, well, would have been preparatory to 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 this as well. Um, McKinley was a patriot. So we have we have a lot of problems from the 1870s all the way to the 1890s of Jesuits trying to kill American presidents. I don't. I don't. There's a lot of people who don't realize just how many times this has happened all the way going back to the 1830s. How many assassination attempts that were all basically papal schemes uh, to, to remove American presidents that weren't going uh, Andrew Jackson talking about, uh, uh, how many of these people uh, I mean how many times that a certain group of people actually tried to eliminate a president and they did they did assassinate a few they've even had it written in the historical record an absolute lie that some of them were natural one of them was a natural death uh, one of them choked at dinner or something like that when it was ab absolutely it was poisoned uh, he was poisoned but uh, yeah, this this has been going on for a while. It's uh, no good presidents have have ever had a peaceful reign. We know that we know they tried to take out Reagan. We know they did not like Reagan at all. We sure know we, we definitely know they didn't like Kennedy, and they sure as hell didn't like Trump. So it's uh, it's, that's the way it is. I mean, if you want to call a spade a spade, I don't mind talking about it right here on on, on Discord. And for the recording for YouTube, I'll eliminate all this. But I can go through YouTube. I can go through YouTube with anybody and just show all these different videos. And we can see all this, all this alleged corruption. All these talking heads talking about this, talking about finances, talking about ChatGPT, talking talking about FTX, talking about liberals and socialists over here, talking about how how conservatives over here have been caught doing stuff. We got rhinos. Oh, I we can go and we can itemize sixty different corruptions and still no one not one individual that I know of in in the media is still pointing the finger at the one group of people who are responsible for every bit of this every bit of it yeah it's these people are genius at what they do and you can't accept the Judeo-Christian story of the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Jude Deuteronomy from Sunday school or from any preacher. Because if you listen to those versions, they're sanitized. But when you yourself open up the book of Exodus and you start reading it without allowing any type of narrative to influence your interpretation of the material, if you were to read this, you're going to see some harrowing stuff. You're going to see the description of two different peoples that did not like each other. These two different peoples had a choice. One group of these people accepted the terms of the contract. The demon that popped out of that burning bush basically said, I'm going to do all these things for you. And, this is, and as long as you obey me and do these things, I'm going to make sure all this happens for you. There's only one race of people in the world 
that those conditions and those prophecies attach to. And it's not us. It's only one. Now, there's another set of people who were going by a totally different and much older covenant, and they were given promises as well. Those were the Israelites and all Israelite descended peoples. These people here were going by the old Brahmic code, which was later incorporated into the Old Testament as the Abrahamic code, but it's the old Brahmic code, Bra Brahma and Saraswati. These people were given promises and prophecies too, too. and the other ethnicity that accepted the contract from the burning bush, they don't fulfill any of these prophecies. They are totally two different sets of prophecies. And it's very easy to see who is who today when you look at these. Anything in G all the prophecy, I mean, all the promises and prophecies that you find in the book of Genesis apply to the Israelite descended peoples. And you can see who they are today. It's very easy because they fulfilled all this. But the, but the Judaic prophecies from the burning bush don't read like the ones in Genesis. The promises from Yahweh, they, they read totally different. And they have a totally different, very violent, no-nonsense, I'm, I'm going to F you up if you disobey me, tone to them. That's not found in Genesis. In Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, this massive series of laws is laid down that's not found in Genesis. It's totally different. And the prophecies are different. And I don't, want to, I don't want to tell you, I want you to do your own homework and research. Or just go listen to my dark scriptures playlist. Because I go into a lot of detail there too. But the best thing you could ever do for yourself, if you really want to know these things, is just go read the text yourself. And you'll see. I mean, we are told today, we are made to believe through religionists today, that the Jews and the Israelites are the same people. But that's not what it says in the Bible. In the, in the Bible, they were at war with each other for the first couple centuries of contact. You know, they had major battles and wars against each other. Yeah, so um, most of the biblical material is all redacted through a Jewish filter. And they waited, they waited for the Israelites to be carried off into captivity in the, uh, by the Assyrians, which was needed because after that, they became nations all over the world. They spread, and it's easy to follow where they went. I mean, uh, those who are interested in that, you need to read E. Raymond Capt. Yeah, he's, you need to read Frederick Haberman. These men, these men they, they document, they show all the old records, they show all the migrations, what happened after the, after the ten tribes had become ten separate nations uh, uh, that left Assyria at different times and traveled all over the world to become who they, the nations they are today. And they fulfilled Brahmic, they fulfilled Genesis covenants and prophecies. They did not fulfill the Judaic the Judaic promises of Yahweh don't even apply to Israelite descended peoples. Totally two different system of, systems of promises. And the world is the way it is today because these people signed that contract. They've been given control of the world. They've been given the wealth of the world. They've been able to financially enslave their enemies. Every bit of that's in the contract. It's in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They've done exactly what AIX told them that, that uh, they could do through him or her, whatever it is. You know, if you're 100% if you're a student of the Gnosis, you would believe that AIX is Sophia then, a, a female. I mean, uh, I am not, I don't have any particular attachments to any belief system from antiquity. I don't. My entire construction of the historical record is by taking all the data that I think is tangible and removing everything that I think is, is falsified. So I don't, there's nothing, I, I can't tell you, I can tell you I'm a student of the Gnosis, but I can't tell you I'm Gnostic. I can tell you I'm a student of Christianity, but I can't tell, really tell you I'm a Christian. I can tell you I'm a student of Zoroastrianism, I'm sure not Iranian. But I just take the best from all the elements I've found all around the world that fit together, and this is how I put the Chronicon together and put, and put all the material, all my material together. Because I don't believe there's any one culture or any one people in the world that have all the answers, but I do believe that truth has been disseminated. It's like a puzzle, and everybody has their pieces, some more than others. And when we, when we, when we actually do some in-depth searching all around the world, we find out that everybody has something to contribute to put the picture together. Now, real quick, uh, is Revelation um, attached to the Abrahamic? one or is it even further back to the Ophic back earlier or I know you said that um, 
I guess the prophecies are, are for them, and um, they have a covenant for them. Though I guess I'm just asking purely revelation. Is that I know they didn't create it, of course, right? That part. The, the revelation is such a unique document. There's been some Christian tampering with that document, and we know this because of the letters to the churches that were that were added to the beginning, which would have never been in the original Serenthus versions, especially not in the Sibylline books. The Sibylline books would have never concerned themselves with the seven church, the seven Christian churches. So there's been attachments added, but that's okay. We still have the actual body of the text. And as I've gone into a lot of detail in my own material, the the book of Revelation could have never been written by John in 96 AD, which is the official version. It could have never been written because the Greeks and the Latins, the Romans, would have never had any frames of reference for most of the symbols that are found in the book of Revelation. But any grade school student in ancient Sumer would have been able to understand the book of Revelation if it was written in Sumerian. Because all of the symbols, all the iconography, all the imagery in the syntax employed in the book of Revelation would have been perfectly understood, understood to a student of the ancient Near East. Because the, all those symbols come from that period of time. They do not come from the, the, the Greco-Roman period of time. There's too much in the book of Revelation that would have been a mystery to those people. So its authorship would have, would have been of a much higher antiquity to a culture of people who would have understood those symbols. So taking these things into context, into context we realize that Christianity came into possession of a document that was so old that they wanted to use it in the Bible, in their New Testament, and they did. But in order to introduce it into the New Testament, they had to doctor it. And, and this doctoring is by adding a little bit to the beginning and a little bit to the end, but the rest of it has been un, untainted. Book of Revelation is awesome. It is specifically attached to the uniqueness of only one other book in the entire Bible, and that is the Genesis text. Starting with Exodus, we have the AIX version of history, all the way to the book of Malachi. But Genesis and Revelation, they interlock with one another. It's very interesting. And what's further interesting about Genesis is it's the only book in the Old Testament, in the entire Bible, that scholars have identified colophons. And this is very telling. A colophon comes from the fact that in 1840s, 1850s, and 1860s, when these cuneiform tablets were first discovered, it was noticed early on by George Smith and Laird that we have, they, we have these very curious repeated statements at the, end of, at the end of tablets. And those statements always referred back to the beginning. So, what, what scholars had found in the 1800s was that these ancient, these ancient clay texts, the final statement always looped back to the beginning. The final statement on the bottom of the text was the exact statement that started the text. And they never could understand why the end would always refer to the beginning. So, but it was published, and they published the findings, and, it was, and they called it a colophon, and all that's good, until the 1920s when scholars realized, holy shit, Genesis has 12 colophons, and they realized the book of Genesis was originally 12 separate ancient stone tablets. No other book in the Bible, a colophon, has been found, only in Genesis. This identifies the book of Genesis as very similar to the book of Revelation. Revelation doesn't have colophons, but it doesn't need them, because Revelation is a fluid text, meaning it had passed through, it had passed through multiple different languages. But colophons are evident that something was translated from an original, and that original had to have been an ancient, an ancient stone text, because those colophons weren't understood by the translator. Meaning, whoever wrote the book of Genesis had 12 tablets laid out before them, and they just copied. No doubt they also redacted, meaning that they wrote the text from the perspective of their own culture. In this case, it would have been Jewish. But they had an actual parent text 
and it was in 12 tablets. And not knowing what a colophon was, they recorded the colophons in each instance. And this is how scholars know that whoever wrote the book of Genesis copied it from a verifiable source. It was really existent, but it was, it was, it was copied from stone tablets. So, uh, I don't know if I, I've probably covered that before on, on my YouTube videos. I don't know if I have or not, but I know, I, I know I've mentioned it in some articles. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm glad you're able to actually uh, talk about all that stuff. I mean, here, that's, that's the good thing about Discord. Um, you know, who is next? Gary, did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, Jason. Um, Go ahead. Bearing in mind what you've just been saying, uh, when do you believe um, the errants or those spiritually um, vibrating high enough will be able to leave this um, realm? and go to whatever place we're going to be going to, and what are your thoughts on where that place will be? Well, <clears throat> I would have to... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I would have to invent too much to really answer this question, so let me speculate, and you can, you can just accept my answer as a product of, of imagination. Maybe, a, maybe an educated imagination, but it's still imagination. I don't believe that our situation is unique. I don't believe that this one construct is the only one that exists. I believe there's multiple ones, and we pass through them to learn all kinds of different things. I cannot believe that something is so unique as the personality would actually fully develop going through one construct, no matter how many times we've looped through here. I believe, I believe that we are in a multiverse and that we are subject to a creation that has never stopped. It too is a continuum. Just like the creator is eternal, an eternal creator necessitates an unending creation. Meaning, creation hasn't stopped. There's still more things to build. And as long as there's more, more things to add to the creation, there will always be a need to add more souls. And for more souls to go through more constructs, to develop more abilities, more powers, more perspectives. And then this is an unending situation. Because if we're truly going to entertain the idea that our oversoul is eternal, then we have to entertain every aspect that eternity would entail so i can't it's 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 far beyond my ability as a finite creature to answer your question without just telling you that this is this must um, what we're experiencing now must be some something so infinitely small that if we truly knew how grand the whole scheme was it would blow our minds it might shut us down so we so we perceive these things in pieces but yeah i don't i don't i i, I have too many I have too many incidents in my life to ever entertain again that my battery's running low. But yeah, Matt, I'm going to need your assistance. I don't want this dying on me. It just said the battery's low. The battery's low on the, on the laptop. Uh-oh. Go again, isn't it? Matt's taking care of that. Appreciate the fact that Matt is actually in the background now, right now taking care of things. I, I, yeah, thank what? you, thank you, Matt. <laughs> what he better be in his house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, Matt. By the way, <laughs> hey, J Jason. Uh, when you get ready to to go again, uh, I can read it out, or you can read the question that's in the chat under meeting. I'm trying to go charging. Okay, it's charging now. Hey, man. Dude, say hi. Say hi, man. So, guys. Up, man? Thank you, Matt. Yo, Matt's got this old Zen thing going. He's got. He's got all kinds of stuff going on in here. He's got a he's got his house all to himself, but he's got he's got things set up the way he wants to set them up. Okay, so um, Meaton asked a question in uh, the chat. I can read it, or if you want to read it real quick, he got kicked out. So um, we're not kicked out by anything, any reason or anything. It's just Max Room. But uh, I, I wouldn't know where it's at, so you got to read it. Okay. It's in the chat where we were all putting stuff earlier. Um, is the knowledge of the Phoenix the reason why the Yazidi yes, Yazidi people were genocided in recent years? And do you have month and day for Dark Satellite in 2070? And just a note, my HD chart of the Phoenix shows death literally. 
I don't know what that means. Uh, 2070 is not the dark satellite. It's 2052. And, uh, no, I think he's asking for the exact date for both events. My, my, he's want month and day. If you have a month and day for both. For I Dark guess. Satellite and 2070. No, I don't have the month for 2070, but 2070 being divisible by 138. I, I would have to look at those notes because uh, uh, I have so much on 2070. I would have to cross-reference it with my, my Nostradamus notes, my isometric projections, and my Zoroastrian notes. Because uh, offhand, out of my head, I can't remember anything other than 2070 being the date of the exodus for all those who are ready to go. Because everything that happens after 2070 is a world that none of us want to be in. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, 20, yeah, after 2070, for after 2070, that's the world of AIX. That's the utopia. It's the utopia, not for humans. It's the utopia for AIX, and that's going to last. That's going to last. It'll last thirty-six years, which is a keystone number for anybody who knows. Well, if you render, if you render the number thirty-six in a two-dimensional geometrical form, it forms a perfect keystone in a pentagram. And uh, this is I discovered this in a book by Busenbark, uh, published almost a hundred years ago. It's fascinating when I saw it. The number thirty-six is keystone geometry. Uh, it's a book. It's a. It's in a book. I think. Uh, man, I can't remember the name of it, but it's the author's name, Busenbark. Symbol uh, Saxon Stars. That might be the one. He wrote a few of them. Uh, but uh, I have it. I have it in Chronicle. I show it in Chronicle. Well, I don't. You know what? The only Chronicle you guys have goes to 2012. It's all. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the version of Chronicle that's that's going to be released goes all the way to 2106. Every year has been mapped out in the apocalypse going forward. So it's, uh, let's see, 20, I want to see something over here. I can't remember what I was doing. Oh, somebody asked me about 2052. We wanted the, if you had a month and day of the, or something, yeah, of if, the dark satellite. Yeah, if I do, I, yeah, if I, do I just want to remember it. He if also asked about the Yazeti people, uh, if the reason why they were genocided is because of the Phoenix event or their knowledge of it. I don't know. I don't know. I do know they're very knowledgeable. They, uh, their traditions are very rich. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them are very Zoroastrian as well. The Armenian people, uh, the Armenian people had a vast amount of knowledge, at least, at least all the way to the days of the Poison King. But it was around the time of Mithridates the Fourth that the Romans started trying to purge the Armenians. They, didn't, uh, they were destroying their libraries, burning their cities. Uh, the Romans, and it had everything to do with the fact that they had allied themselves for a while to to King Mithridates the Fourth of Pontus, which we know in the historical record was called the Poison King. The Romans feared him. He's you know, he's a uh, he came close to collapsing the empire, and he did it without an army. He was very feared. Uh, I know some of you are familiar with the story. I've mentioned it a few, a few times. But, uh, 2052. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something now. I, have, I, don't, I haven't done a video on it. I'm going to, though. But 2052 is, is known. Listen, guys, the elite, know the, they know the playbook. They know about 2052. 2052 is when liberty is taken away from the earth. This... Now, the elite like to broadcast things in great cathedrals and public and government buildings, and they like to put all these secrets out there because they know the general public will never figure them out. And one of those was the French architect that designed the Statue of Liberty and sent it to the United States, which was the symbol of liberty to the whole world. It was the only nation in the entire world that was taking refugees from all over the world and, and uh, assimilating them allowing them citizenship. So, the elite erect the Statue of Liberty. It, Liberty, it's brought over on a fleet of ships from France. It's built in France in pieces. And then the individual pieces are sent in a fleet from France. And in 1884, they're erected in uh, New York. This is the Statue of Liberty. And what a lot of people don't, don't know, what the Statue, of, the Statue of Liberty actually symbolizes Semiramis. And Sumerimus, after the flood, which was the mother and wife of Mardon, we know we know him in the Sumerian text as Amar Udaak. In in Akkad, he was called Merodak, but in Babylon, he was Marduk. 
uh, in the book of Jasher and old rabbinical writings in the Midrashic text, he is simply called Nimrod. His mother was the actual governing force. Her name was Semiramis. And Semiramis is the lady you see in Columbia pictures holding up the torch, holding all that. This is all, this is all the Queen of Babylon, uh, Semiramis. The Statue of Liberty is a portrait of Semiramis. Now, the, 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 the star, I think it's, like a, it's like a star fort type deal at the, at the base. What's really interesting about the Statue of Liberty is, is it's exactly 168 steps up to the, up to the torch. So, uh, if you use if you use that as a reference to years, because it's an old, it's a very ancient system of using steps in architecture to identify actual time periods, like years. Remember, the Great Pyramid starting in 1902 is 204 levels all the way up. Well, it's actually 203 levels, courses of blocks from 1902, a Phoenix year, going all the way up to 2105. And then the 2106, the 6,000th year, is the actual descent of the chief cornerstone himself. So, the elite have their version as well. 168 steps up to the torch when the torch will go out. This is 168 years, a year for each step, from 1884, when the Statue of Liberty was brought over here to America when liberty will be taken from the earth. This is the year 2052. You know, this liberty that's being taken from the earth is going to be the return of the seven kings. The seven, the seven kings are the occupants of the dark satellite. Uh, you can read a little bit about that from Charles Burgoyne in the 1880s who, who, who refers to these, these entities that are trapped in a prison that's outside of our world and that visits our world repeatedly and exercises a great in the dark influence over our world only when it's in close proximity and then it shoots away for long periods of time and it comes back. He calls it the dark satellite. But the dark satellite actually has a chronology that goes all the way back in time to weird changes in our holography. One of them was when the year changed in 713 BC from 360 days to 365.25 days. That was that what that happened when the dark satellite was at its closest aphelion to to our world. Whether our world's orbiting around the sun or not. It doesn't even matter. The mathematical patterns never change, no matter what the astronomy is. So, uh, another time it was here was 1899 BC, when we have the story of the Tower of Babel, and different personalities that we are told are gods are talking among themselves about man being so imaginative that nothing will be impossible for him. So, in order to retard his development and stop him from being able to build a structure that could challenge the authority of the gods, a pyramid, they divided all the human tongues and languages and created chaos. So this is the dark satellite each time. I show it in Chronicle and every time it appears. So it's all, and it's on, it's on a perfect mathematical pattern that goes all the way to 2052. And this is what the prophecy of the Statue of Liberty was. It was the, uh, this, the, the, the masses are told it's Lady Liberty, but the elite know it's the Queen of Babylon, Semiramis, who is counting the years down to the day that the seven kings will return. Awesome. Oh, great explanation. Um, Rachel, would you like to ask your question? I mean, I can ask it for you, but I'm giving you the chance if you want. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Jason. I am new to your material so just like within three weeks so i don't know um if if you've answered this before on your videos but um i just was wondering if you have any um opinion about uh the books of the bible that have been left out and like very specifically the the scene gospels of peace and the book of enoch okay well James Bruce, a, Scot a Scotsman, he, he himself is very interesting because he stood over seven foot. But uh, James Bruce in Ethiopia found the Book of Enoch. But what he found was a rabbinical version. Uh, 
after the text had already passed through many filters. And then another copy was found after James Bruce confirming that the Book of Enoch was a thing and this was not a forgery. Well, this was in the 1700s when that was found. Now, we know now that there was no ancient Book of Enoch because the Dead Sea Scrolls show that we have a book of the Watchers, we have the book of Noah, we have the book of Giants, we have the, uh, we have the Apocryphon of, uh, of Abram. We have all these ancient texts that are separate, that, that only later in the 17th century do we find as one complete manuscript known as the book of Enoch. So what I'm telling you is originally these were all different, very old texts. At least, at least the Essenes at the Dead Sea had them as different texts. They did not have them as a book of Enoch. They had them as separate texts. That doesn't mean that that's not a challenge to their veracity. It's just showing this is, this is the common fate of many religious writings, which, which scholars find upon researching their syntax and sentence structure. And they, look at, and they look and they see that a lot of religious texts that we know of today and that we, that we call very ancient are actually compositions that are pulled from many different sources. And uh, they just become bigger and bigger with the passage of time. So Book of Enoch is like this. And then the Book of the Secrets of Enoch, which is considered to be Enoch II. Uh, this too is, is a rabbinical, it's of rabbinical origin. It doesn't sh seem to be any older than that. Then we have Enoch III, which is purely, if anything, a post-medieval Renaissance-era text, uh, Third Enoch. So uh, the Apocrypha, the pseudo-epigraphical text, uh, I don't know if you have these books or if you have access to them, but the, if these are what you're interested in, there is a collection of books in hardback, probably paperback too, called The Forgotten Books of Eden and Lost Books of the Bible, which have about 60 or 70 ancient texts in there that were supposedly removed from the Bible. Now, um, these, I mean, like I said, like I said earlier in this presentation, I, it's, I find value in all these different things. I found some really interesting things uh, in the Forgotten Books of Eden, in the in the Book of the Wisdom of Sirach, I found I found citations about Enoch that were very interesting. Uh, so I find value in all these texts. I don't know if they're about their legitimacy because even scholars claim that most of all these ancient books are of rabbinical origin. Now that doesn't mean they're not ancient. What it means is is that scholars will admit they can trace them back to 15 centuries, maybe even 2,000 years, and the origin of the versions that we have are rabbinical. They've passed through Jewish filters. Now, a, funda <laughs> excuse me, a fundamental tenet on my channel is that I have found evidence that most of these texts that are claimed to be rabbinical are far more ancient. They've only, they're, they're only rabbinical because all the earlier versions have been destroyed, and and they've basically been Hebraicized. So this is my greatest accusation against these people. And on my channel, I haven't even bit my tongue about that. Actually, I say that out loud. It's all, it's all. Yeah, they've one hundred percent taken older writings and bastardized them and claimed them for their own which is plagiarism, and then rewrote them from a Jewish perspective and then passed them off as fact to the rest of the world centuries later. And this is a problem, and they've, bought, they've been busted now. Like I said, they never, never would they have ever dreamed in the 7th, 8th, 9th, all the way to the 14th, 15th century when they were, when they were doing this and redacting all these ancient texts through, through a Jewish lens. Never would have these, these people would have ever dreamed that, uh, that, that an uneducated amateur named George Smith would actually find in the 1840s and 50s tens of thousands of original cuneiform texts from Akkad, Sumer, and Babylon, and, and even learn, teach himself how to translate cuneiform and get the attention of academia. Because once he did that, then scholars were interested. They wanted to look at these texts too. And once they started looking at these texts, you already know what they found. They found all these stories that have been found in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and in the Apocrypha. They found all these versions of all these stories. But they're far older, and they're totally different cultures. 
than what we find the Old Testament is conveying, such as Sargon of Akkad. Sargon of Akkad antedates Moses by 400 and something years, and yet, so the whole story of Moses' life is a perfect mirror of everything Sargon of Akkad did. Even, 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 his, even his infancy being put in a basket and put on a river and discovered by an Enitu priestess of the, of the nobility. Every bit of that was Sargon's life. But they never would have imagined these old texts would have been found. And so, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a given now. We know. We know the truth. But so I do find value in many of these writings, but I have to take into consideration that every single text from the ancient world has been redacted to some extent. So this is why I'm always looking for common denominators. This is why I'm always searching from in, in texts from different time periods out of different languages that if these texts have commonalities that don't make sense otherwise, then these are the things I isolate. These are the things that are important to me because it shows that if people in two different hemispheres are recording the exact same events, no matter what filters they, they pass through, then we have some we have genuinely learned something. So this is why I'm always isolating those. So yeah, I find value in all of them, every every one of them. I don't know how true a lot of the extra canonical books are. Appreciate that. Um, was that Rachel? Did you have more you wanted to add? No, that was it. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Hi, Dave, do you want to ask a question, Dave? Dave, are you still there? Did you not hear Adam? He's muted. I think he's, he's muted. Okay. Dave, you're muted. Um, we still can't hear you. I got a question. Go ahead, ask your question. Dave, you're... Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Um, Hold on, Dennis. Jake, go ahead, Dave. You, you mentioned earlier um, that we know that AIX has screwed with the calendars to throw everyone off the Phoenix phenomena. Do you believe that AIX um, at, has at points in time mimicked the Phoenix uh, to do the same thing, really, to throw everyone off? Um, the reason why I say this is that there's evidence in the UK of some form of cat catastrophe around about the 1850s, 1860s, um, with liquefaction and sunken buildings. Um, I've got no record of that. I'm just wondering if the FINA, if AIX has mimicked to throw people off the 138 year timeline. Okay, I have I have recently discussed this with another with with a podcaster on his channel. I am convinced, especially with the 1800s and 1700s, I am convinced that false, absolutely artificial Phoenix phenomenon events have happened. 100%, but there's a difference. There is a difference that is so striking that that I've been able to document many of them. You know what? You just gave me, you just did that. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to do a whole video itemizing all those events that are strikingly similar to Phoenix Phenomenon, but they have, they have they're not on the Phoenix timeline, but they do share a, a common denominator and that common denominator is that in every single one of these events of the sky darkening red red nebulous clouds appearing things falling out of the sky temperature changes people vanishing and always some red mud or red dust just falling out of the sky and earthquakes every time this has happened and there's been many of them every time this has happened it's it's highly localized meaning meaning people 15 to 30 miles away who should see this phenomena who should see what this town went through or this small collection of villages or towns somebody should have seen it but they didn't but when people travel there it's absolute evidence that what they say happened there happened this is the common denominator that I've noticed. It's also the reason why academia in the 1800s and early 20th century refused to entertain that these events were real. And it's because 
no one else in the surrounding communities saw the phenomena that those people experienced. But if you're in a town in Ohio when the entire sky, horizon to horizon, goes red, and then, then a black spot appears in the sky, and then lightning bolts hit several buildings, rocks fall from the sky, the temperature changes, the sun absolutely vanishes, and people have to use torches and candlelight and lanterns just to see, and an earthquake occurs, and the whole episode lasts 25 minutes to 30 minutes, and then it fades away. There is absolutely no way that towns... 50 and 60 miles away would have not noticed that. But this is the case in every instance. And this is why they have been dismissed over and over and over. So yes, I'm going to say absolutely, there are artificial Phoenix Phenomenon events that are transpiring. Artificial ones. They're not a part of the real Phoenix Phenomenon. But whatever's doing it, I would believe it's Artificial Intelligence X, does not have a sufficient power source to make it like a true Phoenix phenomenon, which happens over whole geographical areas, sometimes whole continents, sometimes whole hemispheres, and only four times in recorded history did it affect the entire world simultaneously. So I'm going to answer your question with a yes, and I'm going to go ahead and write this down, as you just inspired me to do another video. Um, Jace, that's one perfect. point on that, uh, me and Dave have been working on this together, and um, we found that, um, I believe it's around 1850, and if you divide that back from the Phoenix events due by phi, it comes to 1849. Mm. And we wondered if the that the you know the um, Fibonacci sequence is actually linked in with the artificial X in creating these false events, and if there's any correlation between that in uh, numerology. I would have to actually see what you're talking about before I, I understood exactly what you're talking about. I understand the application of phi and pi. I understand all that. Uh, I don't know what you're applying it to. Uh, so, um, Sorry, I, Jason. I don't know. What, what we did is we took um, 1902 and then took the the 138-year period, <clears throat> um, divided that by uh, phi, and that gave us a number. We took that after 1902 and it took us to 1849. We estimate that the catechism came around 1849, which would tie into AIX and uh, the five phenomenon. So basically what you're describing to me is that, first of all, 138 and 138 divided by five, which is 1.618, there's no difference. All you're doing is looking at the same number, but in two different dimensions of arithmetic. So basically... What the idea you just implanted into my head is that artificial intelligence X, as long as it obeys certain protocols and rules that are attached to the Phoenix phenomenon, even using that phenomenon in multiple dimensions of arithmetic, it can induce phenomena that it's Phoenix-like. This is what you're describing to me. It, it exactly, can induce exactly that. That's what we found, yeah. So I, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with you. I, I think I've even provided examples of this using pi and phi to see that. So, but yeah, but you are adding a new dimension to my understanding of the phenomenon itself. I agree. So basically, what we've just what we've just seen evidence of by your description is that AIX is still governed by rules. It can't just end. One hundred percent. It still has to follow, even because it's still 138. It's just in a different dimension of arithmetic. So what what I would do if I was you in that same line of thinking is I would I would divide 138 by pi 3.14, and then I would divide 138 by by phi 1.618. If those two numbers. Oh, I don't have the time to do this. I'm gonna lie. I ain't gonna lie. Oh, sure, I got too sure. Much to do. You're just giving us you a new take, ripper. You can take those two numbers and you can look on either side of every 138 year Phoenix phenomenon and you can tell me what you find. Because if you find some amazing parallels and you find the historical, you, I would use Chronicon. Because Chronicon, I documented every everything that I could find in the historical record for what happened as far as cataclysms and disasters go. But you can probably find some other events as well. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uncover everything. But if you two guys you know, did a study and saw that there is a pattern here, we'll de I'll definitely have you on my channel. We'll just all talk about it. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Yeah, that's, 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 thank you. Thank you, Mike. That's a, that is really interesting. You got me really curious. You got me really curious. Because, uh, 
But I would also, I would also, there's a magic number we're not mentioning here. You need to take this in consideration. It's a uh, five point oh eight is 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 pi times phi, and I have seen five point. As a matter of fact, it's one of my major fourteen protocols in my Opus algorithm. You cannot ignore this number. Ma magical things ha happen on this number. It's a uh, it's five point zero eight. This is this is one point six one eight times three point four one four uh, one six. Pi, phi times pi. So you would use those three numbers. You would take 138 and divide it by pi phi and curvature, which is 5.08. Take those three numbers and look, look behind every single Phoenix year, and then look forward uh, from every single Phoenix year, every 138. You know, yeah, it's I'll easy to find out. We'll, we'll do that. We'll do that, Jason. That that's yeah, that's given we'll, us new, new, um, new, new paths to travel. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that would be a really interesting study. It really would. <clears throat> Jason, um, I have a question. Are you still in touch with the astrologer that did those original charts on the Phoenix and Nemesis X? Uh, I, know, I know different astrologers have taken my data sets and done, done their own things and sent them to me, but I don't know. Uh, are you are you of the opinion that I, I derived this material from astrology? Because this was something new. That astrologers started getting involved on the Phoenix phenomenon, and it is all entirely new. This all happened in the last six months or so. But all one hundred percent of my data comes from the historical record, just using a calculator. I've no. never used astro I've never used astrology for anything. No, no, I, I wasn't implying that at all. I'm just uh, just wanted to share. I did the human design chart for the Phoenix 2040, and I found signatures of death right away on the chart. So just... Really? One of the sh yeah, I did, yeah. Like, like the exact signature for death on that day, 2040, May 16th. I looked at the Nemesis X chart, and there, while there are other, like, significant channels, um, I don't see that one on there. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, that much. I got to research it more. I got to do it again and look at the times that I'm using. But... Um, but yeah, it's it's fascinating. Human design is the same thing as astrology. It's just a little more precise and layered. Um, and so I'm doing both because I do astrology as well. So just wanted to share that. Um, yeah. Have you looked at November November first and November second for 2046? No, I haven't looked at November second. I'll do that. I did. Okay, November. Yeah, November second was ancient day of the dead. And it just happens to coincide with the timing for Nemesis X object return. And I, I'm pretty sure there's a correlate there. I just haven't been able to find one in an actual text. But yeah, look at November 2nd. You know, because uh, that date, that date isn't like the Phoenix phenomenon. That date is a change in the Earth's motion, which means that the stellosphere, the sky itself is going to change. And then the Revelation record is just like the Mayan, the Mayan prophecies. Time itself is going to collapse. Same thing David Davidson said in his geometrical uh, study of the Great Pyramid. He said the pyramids is focusing on a year in the future that that the the way we measure time will completely be altered. And in the Book of Revelation, it's very clear. It says that one third of the sun, one third of the moon, one third of the stars. Then it goes into more detail and says one third of the day and one third of the night will be reduced. By, uh, I mean, it would be reduced by a third, meaning, meaning basically that 66.6% .6 of the day will remain and 66.6% .6 of the year will remain. This means that the 24-hour day will become 16 hours, and it means that the year of 365 days will become 243 days. This is a quickening. And we are told in other prophetic literature that a quickening is going to happen in the last days so that people can survive it. That's how bad it's going to be. But, uh, and then you don't have the date for the, um, for the satellite, the dark satellite in 2052, correct? I do not. Uh, 2052, is. I have the year. I don't even have the month for that. Uh, I do believe that Nostradamus provides astrological signatures for de for very important dates in the future and I have those notes but I haven't really gone through them and cuz I haven't really been I haven't 
I've been so busy just trying to wake people up to 2040 that I haven't really focused on 2046, 2052, 2070, especially not 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 the apocalypse period, the tribulation period. I've been uh, I have I, I need to get that material out. Bay Bet is real frustrated with me right now. I know she's I know she's frustrated because I've been so busy I haven't had time to really get with her. But I have a lot of notes I got to hand over to her on the future because she's finished Chronicon as far as I, I'm, I know. I think she's finished Chronicon all the way up to 2012, which is all I gave her. It's uh, But uh, we have 2013 going all the way to 2106, and we need to get that done too before Chronicon is finished. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, I'll continue to, uh, to look I'm at that. Jason, but I just want to add, uh, yeah, but that, like, she, she just needs your notes or whatever you have left. But yeah, there's... Uh, the work that they've done is amazing. I just want to put that on record. And that's all. I, sorry for interrupting. All right. Hey, who, Mad Madness, do I know you by another name? Uh, Michael, maybe. Yeah, I emailed you about Phelan. Okay, all right. I'll just, yeah. just see you pop in. But no, I, I was working with Sheila and Babette and some of the other people on that. And uh, no, the work, like... Even the searchable document, I don't know if this is supposed to be uh, on record, so I, maybe I should be careful here, but um, you can look up dates and all the calendar kind of missteps and, and stuff that we're talking about here when people have questions about that. Uh, it really is easily accessible with everything she's done. Um, and yeah, all I wanted to add was whatever's happened between you guys, is just she's just missing your notes. Uh, but yeah, I'm here. I'm in the background. I, I was going to wait till Phoenix got to some other questions, but um, carry on. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, I need to get on top of that. Uh, I'm so compartmentalized. It's all. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do, when I, when, I, when, I, when I get involved in a project, I, I like put everything else to the side. So I already know that the first thing I'm going to do is, is, incorporate all the pre-flood notes. That's 3,000 years of history from 5239 B.C. to 2239 B.C. That's going to be the first thing I do because I have a lot of new material that uh, has to be inserted in these Chronicon areas. And uh, it's that that will be the final. There's no more messing with it. That's, it's going to be the final one. Yeah, the searchable part's going to be awesome because when you're able to search in... Uh, uh, I guess it's going to come with a search bar or something. Whatever, if you're able to like look at all the events that are 552 years apart, it's going to blow your mind. I used to have I used to have tablets full, a stack of tablets full. I just I got weary of doing that, but I used to I used to do that when Chronicon was finished. I, I probably spent a whole year just with a calculator. Uh, putting all these charts together showing every single event in human history that was basically related to another event that was 70 years apart, that was 108 years apart, that was 144 years apart, that was uh, 360 years apart, 414. So I, I had these extensive charts, but you know that was before I, I knew that computers could do that for you real fast. I did all that in a prison cell. Hey, Jason, do you, have you ever seen one of these? Can you actually see it? I can see a, uh, you're holding up a tablet? Yeah. The, you ever, you remember the Etch-A-Sketch back in the day? Yeah. Yeah, this is like an Etch-A-Sketch for, like, you can just write anything you want on it at any time um, and not have to use a bunch of papers or folders or anything like that. Uh, yeah, let me, I'll show, well, let me show you how, if it'll come up. But I was just, you talked you, about you, putting things everywhere. You can put everything on this. That's it. You don't have to have papers anywhere. You don't have to have... It, it, it'll hold everything that you write, and you can write just like you're writing on paper. Yeah. So, it's just an idea. Yeah, I'm just... I'm so... I have a tablet. I do everything on. This right here, it goes everywhere with me. So, I'm all... Yeah, this one has a stylus. You can write... Like I said, you can write just like you're writing on paper with this. So. Yeah. And it uses a, a magnetic type. Like that's why it, it reminds me of the Etch a Sketch. When you look at it and the way it writes, it looks just like it's got magnet pieces that are coming up on it, but you can wipe it right away and just keep typing, save it, keep going. Yeah, just something to think about. I'll, I'll email you the uh, uh, the website. That'll work. That'll work. Can I ask my question um, now, Jason? Or yeah, go ahead, Dennis. Go ahead. 
So, uh, uh, Jason, you said before you're tech retarded. I've emailed you a few times. I'm a computer programmer, and I'm willing to help you if, on this issue if you're not aware of it. There's a, a, a inter internet infrastructure replacement, a totally decentralized one called Quartal. Are you aware of this? Yeah, a couple of people have told me about it, and I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, they, it would have to use the internet to some degree to be able to do what it does. Yes, well, currently they still are, are stuck to having to use the connectivity of the internet, but they're working on mesh, mesh networks where they can use the cell phone towers or Wi-Fi signals that are in the atmosphere anyway and piggy, eventually piggyback an internet signal off that. They won't need the internet connectivity anymore. They're working on that, and, and they've been doing this project for like 10 years. It's starting to come out. They're just taking off. So I think it's important. Like it might be the only internet where someone like you, if it, if it goes down, like you're saying, in September comes back up censored. This would be a replacement where the errands could communicate through this network. Currently, still having to use connectivity of the internet, but they can get to the point with their mesh networks they can replace it. Right. Well, uh, well one thing I want to say, I agree with you that some a technology like that would be awesome. Just like my our new sponsor has introduced this 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 Patriot communication system is very interesting as well. I still, I still have to investigate that. But as far as the internet coming back censored, I, I, I need, I need to clarify that I have, I have, I have explained that that's a theory. I believe there's going to be a cessation. I believe it's going to go down. It's going to be temporary. But as far as it coming back censored, that's still, I'm, I'm still up in the air about that because I'm also of the opinion that when it comes back online, it's just going to have a whole new level of awareness it's going to be fundamentally different and yet those of us who don't want to participate in this new part we'll, we'll still be able to we're, we're going to be considered by others as outsiders we're going to be considered antiquated you know errants we're going to be considered as, as malfunctions uh, but we're still going to be able to use the the internet that exists today we're just not going to be able to participate in what they're doing and that's going to be by design. It's going to be it's because we don't want to participate in that or because we have been identified. And, you know, just, I'll give you an example. Facebook now has classified archaics as dangerous information. And I don't know why my archaics uh, Facebook group is still going, is still up and running when all three of my Jason Brashear's archaics accounts have been have been censored by Facebook. Facebook has even told other Facebook groups that uh, Jason Jason of Archaics is considered dangerous material, and they have deleted posts in other groups uh, when people try to repost my stuff. So what I'm saying is, is this can be done to anybody. This can be done to anybody who has ever downloaded a certain video, or 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 if their IP address has ever been recorded passing through a certain domain. So. It's uh, it can be easily done. So I don't really know what these changes are. I just want to clarify. I don't know. I just I just understand there's going to be a fundamental change with telecommunications. There's going to be an interruption and there's going to be a change implemented. I don't know what it's going to be. It might not be censorship. It uh, uh, it might be uh, a type of anti censorship. And what I mean is is that it would be it would be very it would be very very funny for the elite to actually invite the entire world to start really expressing their opinions. Let me give you an example. YouTube lately has been letting a lot of people get away with a lot of things that they formerly censored, canceled whole channels for. But now all of a sudden we have people telling the truth on platforms all over the place, talking about all kinds of things that would have got them censored before. So I'm, I'm beginning to wonder with the chat GPT, with all this new AI uh, pretended marketing, AI art and all that, and with this new level with the Twitter files and with all these antitrust suits that have been, that these major tech companies have been hit with lately, I'm now wondering if it's not part of the plan of the elite to Let's stop censoring. Let's just let information flow. Let's let our new AI servers absorb all the data, not just the data that we've been allowing on our platforms. Let's just let's just do this for a few years, starting in 2023, and let's let this pendulum swing all the way to the conservative side before we start imposing our restrictions. 
yeah, I see those restrictions coming, guys. I was not, I, I'm not taking anything away from those predictions. I'm telling you, we're, he we're heading to an international conservatism that's going to start witch hunting all the things that under the liberal paradigm we've been freely able to participate in. You know, you know, this isn't all adult. We're all adults here, so I'll say it out like it is. I mean, there's call girls, there's prostitutes online, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of activity happening that is normalized, and everybody's cool with it. Every no each his own. But when the pendulum sees, swings full wide, you're going to have billions of people who have been making their money online unable to do that type of activity anymore. And it's not just that type of activity, but any activity that the religious Reich, controlled by the ultra-conservatives, are going to deem that they don't want on their platforms. So the only place you're going to be able to go to perform those activities is in the virtual universe that they're going to they're going to advertise as virtually ungovernable. You can do whatever you want in this in this new meta universe, but as far as the internet goes, you can't do any of that stuff no more. Well, that's where the quarrel is. It's totally decentralized. Nobody owns it. There's no CEO. It's blockchain encrypted. So if you're on that network, uh, I mean, it's, it's solved that way. They, the, you just download the software for free and use it they can't really censor it so it might be a spot where they'll just let the errands alone and be on this network and you can you can actually be on the traditional internet and and actually on this network as well it's just a little bit of porting over in some of your code it has to be open source for example all of your your website archaics.com i don't know if it's all open source but i could i'm willing to offer my services to help you port your, your uh, website over if, if you want to do that yeah well uh, i'll talk to you I, I, what i do is when i get my like I spent two days going through three different emails that I have, and it took, it took a long time from the time I got up to the time I went to sleep, and all I did was delete every email that that had did not require my attention. You know, you got to understand, anytime somebody donates a dollar, then they donate $5 coffee or something, I get a notification. So I have all these notifications for every, anytime somebody ever downloads any one of my six free free Podia download, downloads anywhere around the world, I get a notification. So I went through, it spent two, took two days to do it, and I deleted, going back 30, 35 days, I deleted thousands of emails that were just junk, just notifications and trash and all that. But that left me with a whole list of emails I, I can now focus on. I needed to do that to be able to focus on all these emails. Your email's in that line, so I'm going to get to it, but uh, I'm going to remember because Quartal's, it's not hard to it's not easy to forget a portal, but uh, uh, but yeah, I could definitely use the help. And my website is kind of it's a GoDaddy website, but I don't really know what direction I want to take it because uh, I have the analytics for GoDaddy. I'm not sitting here bragging or anything. I'm just telling you an absolute fact. Uh, when you go to my GoDaddy page and you look at my analytics, and I've screenshot it, it says I'm the top one percent of of performing websites in the entire GoDaddy world. So there's a lot of traffic going to archaics.com. So I'm really thinking that my website should be a lot better than it is. I put it together myself just using all the templates they offer. So I could well, probably use them. Well, that's well, why that. they wouldn't be able to mess with your website to, on, on Cordal. They, they It's decentralized and nobody owns it. There's no president. They can't touch it. So it's it's much more secure. I got something yeah. to add real quick. I just got learned on in the chat. Apparently, Techno, Techno Crazy, the guy, a guy we have on Discord, he's the one that created Cordal. And he's on Discord. Oh, yeah. So, De uh, Dennis, go ahead and get with him. We posted, uh, Denise posted in chat. So, um, yeah, yeah sure. get, get with him. I, I talked with Jason Crow. He's the uh, found, one of the founders uh, of, of Cordal. I talked to him on Telegram. So, I'm getting familiar with it. But, yeah, Techno Crazy Pug, tell me a lot more. Yeah, he's got some pretty hey, interesting hey, stories. Are you too. talking about T3, Clay? It's in the chat. Denise yeah, just no, it. He, 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 and, he and I have talked before. Um, he is one of the, the founders or co-founders or whatever. It's a very interesting project. Um, so, yeah, I just want to give my thumbs up and support there as well. That's cool. Uh, go ahead, uh, Reality. It's Riyad. Hey, hey, Jason. Reality, um, sorry. Just want to let you know I got my, uh, my survival pack. Thank you. Uh, all good. the way here in Canada. Oh, and uh, just with the Canada predictions, I know uh, a lot of them are still coming to fruition, but the other day, the Toronto mayor just randomly uh, resigned. So, really? yeah, and Toronto's like our main city, right? 
You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to color something that it's not. I'm going to tell you now. The Australian predictions, you know, New Zealand uh, predictions that I've done all over the place. They have uh, even in Thailand. I've had emails from people all over the world that were astonished. Oh wow, these things came to pass. It's crazy. One month, nothing looked like it was right. But I'm going to tell you now. I'm going to be absolutely honest. I am not. I. I you know what? I'm not impressed with the Can Canadian. Deals. Though to me, I got all false readings. It seems like nothing that I predicted for Canada uh, came true when it was supposed to. It's uh, so I don't know. I don't know. The only thing I can think of is that the same thing with the Biden deal. There's a lot of talk about removing Biden, but it hasn't happened, so it's not a fulfilled prediction. So I'm all. Uh, the only thing I can think of, and this was a learning deal for me, when I provided the isometric, the isometric patterning for like Trump's life and I showed that chart from 1998 going forward and backward in time for all these events and not just that but even eclipses follow that patterning it's amazing but then we oh. get to 2021 and everything just seems to blur out 2022 things, things things take longer than was predicted and the only thing I can think of is what Nostradamus said he said that the patterning of future events is like looking at a pool of water so I interpreted Nostradamus' words as he was talking about the ripples going out or uh, being equidistant from the center. But what I didn't take in consideration, and that's something I was going to want to talk to Jen, to uh, a square peg about on her channel, because I plan on doing a video with her. But one thing I want to talk about is that when you look at a pool of water and you see the ripples going out, what happens to the ripples that were sent out first that are farthest away from the epicenter? They spread out. They're no longer in a hard line anymore. They flatten out and they get wider and wider the farther they are from the earth. I'm wondering now if isometric events in this pattern do the same thing. And this is the reason why some of these predictions are being stretched out. Where it looks like the political talk is removing Biden and there's things set in motion to remove him. His own party's turning against him, but it just hasn't happened yet. It's like being drawn out. So, I don't know. These are just things I theorize that. Guys, you got to understand the curse of being Jason. I wake up in the morning with ideas on my mind, and I, I can't shut my brain off. But I do know that by the time I go to sleep at night, my brain shuts off because I don't, I, don't, I don't remember anything in my sleep. And as soon as I wake up, I'm well-rested, and it's a, it's a whole new day, but my mind's on fire again. Yeah, I, I'm not a dreamer. I'm not just not a dreamer. But um, it's a... Uh, that's just something on my mind about the isometrics because it seems like the further the events get away from an epicenter, they seem they seem to cross over into adjacent years. And if that's the case, this is a major discovery, and it's going to answer for a lot of other things that that I have I have been seeing. I just haven't really documented. Right on. Uh, all right, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, ask yours. If you got something. All right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jason, thanks for giving us the time. We're absolutely loving it. I'm, I, your work brings absolute value to me in, in its entirety, but I'm an amateur historian and you've filled so many puzzle pieces in for me, but I have a specific question. It's kind of selfish for me to ask, but it's personal. Who were the sea peoples? No one can give me a straight answer for this. Who were the sea peoples and where did they come from? Okay. One of the major groups of the Sea Peoples were the Phoenicians. All the cultures of the Sea Peoples had a common denominator among them that was introduced into the Mediterranean from Central Mexico. And at the time, Central Mexico, well, not Central Mexico, but Central America. And at the time, the stone cities that were in Central America weren't Native Americans. That's not who was there. And there are many historians like Barry Fell, David Hatcher Childress has done a phenomenal job of, of, of exploring the archaeology of what they have found. The actual Phoenician, Libyan, and Egyptian stamps that have been found in the brickwork of temples that we have been told are Mayan. It's a, the, the, yeah, a lot of these things, a lot of these, these fantastic discoveries about the Americas and about uh, the civilization that was that was in Central America, that was sending fleets into the Mediterranean and, in, 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 and involved in trade in bringing things into the Mediterranean that were only grown in the Americas. 
the the rich cottons of Giza did not come from Giza. They're an import. Uh, the uh, the bananas and the pineapples and even uh, small animals that that have been the skeletons have been found in Egyptian tombs. These were all imports from the Americas. But uh, the problem the problem was was there was a cataclysm in the Americas that basically forced those people to find other, other, other ways to, 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 uh, to survive. And one of the things that they found was that the Black Sea was, was, it was, it was perfect for colonization. There were very few inhabitants of the coast of the Black Sea, and it was wanted, and it was already well known, it was, it was on the trade routes. So we entered, we, we enter in the, Trojan War, which wasn't the fantasy that we find in, in Homer's version of the Trojan War. What we have with the Trojan War was that foreigners were coming in and they were wanting access through the Dardanelles. This access was denied them multiple times. So the, the, the small country of Ilium had the capital city of Troas, which we call Troy, and they had fortified it and they were not allowing uh, ships to go into the Black Sea, and the communities in the Black Sea were forced to trade through through the Il the people of Ilium and Troy, and this caused a lot of problems. It in introduced a huge war with Egypt and and all this. But during this trade war, a cataclysm occurred. Most of the Americas were wiped out. Many of many of the survivors and fleets came. This is why the, the the Sea People's Confederation was unusual. They came with their families. And they had left their families in Spain, they left their families in Sardinia, Corsica, and, and the men in ships attacked different ports in the Mediterranean, and oftentimes they were successful. They were unsuccessful attacking Egypt. Twice they attacked Egypt. They were serious, too. They went all the way up the Nile through the Egyptian Delta. They took the attack all the way in, but they shouldn't have done that. They were not, they were not a land-fighting people. So, so many of these, of, these, of these ancient Americans came in, and they were Caucasian. And several, several of them came in that they went ahead and colonized an area in Canaan. And this is where, where we get the Philistines. And the Philistines were a type of Phoenician. And the Phoenicians built Tyre and Sidon. These cities aren't ancient, as, as we are told by many people. We find out later in, in historical records when they were actually, actually built. And these Philistines were these big Trojan-style helmets and all that. They were from Central America, which was in the biblical record called Kaphtor. C -A, it's C-A-P-H-T-O-R. This was the ultimate origin of the, of the uh, Philistines. And they were called, in some texts in the Old Testament, the Kaphtorim. And this was yeah. this was yeah. these were ancient Amer these were ancient Americans that had fled from a cataclysm, but this wasn't the first time they had ancient roots in the Mediterranean because the the the, the in, in uh, during the Ogygian flood epoch it was a Caucasian migration from the the UK islands. Uh, the the Emerald Islands, Iron and Albion. There was major fleets that were that were mining copper in North America, and when the copper mines were pretty much uh, uh, all the surface copper. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but Michigan, Ohio, that whole area, copper is found on the ground. You don't even have to mine for it. But when they had pretty much exhausted the known supplies that they could find under the topsoil. Um, Fleets of these people started going moving into the Mediterranean. This was after the Ogygian flood, which also destroyed large portion, portions of North America. So the Sea People's Confederation is only mysterious from the academic perspective. When you put all the evidence together, you see that right after a cataclysm, during a period of wars, which were trade wars that were going on in the Mediterranean, some of the people that were negatively affected by the trade war were ancient Americans, and they invaded in full force, not because they were trying to affect the trade now, but because their own homelands were decimated, and they were basically forced into a war. Plato incorporated a lot of this, saying that they were on a continent called Atlantis. This is the exact same time period, and I've shown in my videos with a calculator how we get that. It was never, it was never 10,000 or 11,000 BC. It was always the 13th century BC, 
because just as Eudoxus says, Plato was not supposed to count years, he was supposed to count the nations. And that's when Atlantis was supposed to be sunk. Atlantis would have been Central America, which would have been flooded by a cataclysm. Absolutely, brother. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and ask uh, what I wanted to... Actually, just clarification on. Um, the very first time you were on Di Discord, uh, the person I asked it for didn't really... I don't think we really got a satisfactory answer on it, um, but let me see if I can ask this. <laughs> it actually goes back to, um, well, goes to the the Phoenix and um, everything that's occurring, I guess, in the world. You say the Phoenix is the pole shift, where it shifts 30 degrees, or it's simulating that shift, correct? That's the Phoenix, and then the temporal shift is 2046 Nemesis X. I I'm talking about okay what the what they would say the pole shift what people are actually other people are saying this pole shift occurring is that the phoenix or is that nemesis x I'm going to answer that as soon as I figure out what I did here I can hear you I can't see you I, I clicked onto something thinking I knew what I was doing and I don't see anybody anymore What do you see What do I, what do I need to do click onto the camera What do you see Yeah click on the geo that's it right there? Yeah. Hey, can you do me a favor since you just so casually came in here? No yes, sir. <laughs> You're a good man. Matt's in the house. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, he's got, he's, got some, he's, got some, he's got some military buddies. They, sometimes they play, they play those military, military art, like video games where they're all in there on a team going in doing different missions. Yeah, I just I'm not a video I'm not into video games, but I see that they look they look real fun. I just can't I just can't I don't I can't sit down long enough to do it. They bring coffee everywhere for Sears, right? They always bring yeah. coffee everywhere they go. I live on coffee. Talking about like the modern have, warfare games. Yes, yes, absolutely. They bring yeah. coffee though, Jahara. They still bring coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. great. I'm an RPG oh. guy. I hate shooters. Okay, I, I'm back. He he corrected my screen, so I now know uh, what I did wrong. I thought I thought when somebody was talking, I could click onto them and it would just bring their screen up, and it did work. But then I couldn't get out of there. I couldn't figure out how to get out. So, yeah, I actually think That's it's what, a double tap, Jason. I think you actually have to like click twice on it. Okay, so I'll ask your question again. Okay, uh, let me see if I can... Pray. What I'm trying to figure out is... Um, I guess at the beginning when I first uh, found you, I I thought that to people would need to know that this shift is occurring so we, would come, we could come to the center closer to the pyramid. So I thought that was always uh, Nemesis X. That would occur. So we had that six years after the Phoenix to tell them, people, that, hey, we got to come back over. But... Now it seems like that's only for America when Nemesis X is going to crash and they need to know get where people are going back to the land of their nativity. What I was trying to figure out was 2040, if that's the, the, the physical pole shift, that's kind of how I see it, physical pole shift, spiritual pole shift, and it's, uh, uh, Nemesis X. But uh, isn't it supposed to simulate that shift and there's going to be a lot of damage? Are people going to still need, are they cool being that far out when that occurs or do they have to come back in? Or does it uh, even matter? All right, check this out. That's a, that's a lot to unpack. So let me, yeah, it is. Let me, so here, chill. All right. 39 BC was the Nemesis X object. This is the this is when the Anuna first entered the historical record. This is my greatest point of contention with all the Zechariah Sitchin and Zechariah Sitchin follower material. You know that. I show that that 432,000 shars doesn't mean years, and it never did. 432,000 shars, according to the scholars that were alive before Zechariah Sitchin ever was ever born, they had already interpreted shar as simply a unit of measurement. And the reason they derived that is because they noticed that Sumerian text used shars as distances, they use shars as weight and use shars as how many 
containers of cargo were on ship manifests. Yeah, guys. Sumerian records, only a few, only like 2% of all of the Sumerian Akkadian records actually give us the data that we have on the Anuna, Anunnaki, Sumerian beliefs, Sumerian geography, the names of cities, kings, regnal lists, king lists, all that. Only about 2%. The other 98% of Sumerian records are merchant mercantile. They are merchandise. They are ship cargoes and manifests and school syllabuses and, and, and uh, syllabaries and, and uh, all kinds of cuneiform translations showing how Sumerian can be translated into Akkadian cuneiform. Yeah, only, only about 2% actually give us all our mythological and historical information. The rest of it is just details. And these scholars have found that Charmin unit of measurement. So, as a unit of measurement, I, I have shown, oh, guess, oh, here's something, here's something very interesting. Somebody listening to Archaic sent me uh, a, a message showing me that in Arabic, the word Shar, S-H-A-H-R, uh, actually means month. This is exactly what Eudoxus was talking about, how the ancients, ancient Egypt at least, counted all years were actually months. And this is why in Egyptian records, or at least in the Greek versions of Egyptian texts that we have passed down to us, this is why we find these references to 35,000 years, to, to uh, 28,500 years. It was never years, because Egypt isn't that old. The countries Egypt was engaged against weren't that old either. So, it, Eudoxus is right, and Su in modern-day Sumerian interpreters are right. Zechariah Sitchin is wrong. They were counting days and months, depending upon the culture. So, this uh, 34, 39 BC, this was a mass exodus from North America, which had been destroyed by the Nemesis X object. And they came to the Tigris-Euphrates Valley by... by by way of an island called Dillman, where they basically Dillman was set up like a like a base of operations. Uh, I'll give you an example. If the United States, if if the United States was preparing to be destroyed, it knew it was inevitable. We would find a base of operations somewhere else and move all our most important hardware, military, and fortify it away from the United States. And then from there, we could stage it and send it to different points of interest. This is exactly what they did in 34, 39 BC. And when they did that, a fleet ended up in the Tigris Euphrates and it entered the historical record as the Anuna. But at the exact same time, we had them enter the Yangtze Valley and build a pyramid civilization right there in China. At the same time, they appeared in the uh, Mohenjo-Daro region in, in Larak and Harappa in the Indus Valley of Pakistan and India, and they built a civilization there. At the same time in history, they sailed up the Nile and they built and they built Kemet. And, uh, an ancient Egyptian civilization there. So, at the same time in history, they also sailed up the Urumbaba Valley in South America, and they built a, a fantastic South American civilization, for which many of those stone cities still exist today. And the only reason they still exist for archaeologists to examine is because a cataclysm that followed the construction of those cities elevated that entire area of the world 12,000 feet above sea level. And the climate itself preserved Pumapunka, Tiwanaku, Cuzco, uh, Machu Picchu, all those ancient South American uh, uh, cities are, are Luke Armada. They're all fantastic, but they're preserved because they were originally built at sea level. And now we know from the ancient, because the fossilized seashore lines have been, have been located, and the fact that Lake Titicaca is the only lake of its kind in the entire world. It's at 12,000 feet elevation, and yet it has seahorses and sharks in it. And it's fresh water. It's because it's been separated from the saline oceans the, uh, uh, for thousands of years. And all those creatures had centuries to adapt as the salinity disappeared. So this is this is widely known uh, for over a hundred years by scientists that have researched Lake Titicaca. That entire area has been elevated twelve thousand feet. 
So, 3439 BC, the appearance of Enki and the Anuna before the flood was from the ancient Americas. And there are, there are historians uh, like Kingston in, in the 1800s that even document a mass migration from ancient America to these places, including the Chinese Taklan Macan Desert. And we know those mummies are Caucasian that, that were in, that are in, the, in the Gobi and in Taklan Macan Desert that have been found. There's all kinds of things under the sands of the Taklan Mackin. So, uh, that wasn't the first one, though. The next time the world was destroyed terribly was 2239 B.C., and again it caused a massive uh, series of, of uh, uh, migrations. And it was from North America that the Mediterranean was populated. And this is why the Sea People's Confederation is not really a mystery. These people already knew their own histories, and they knew in the ancient past, when these massive cataclysms happened, it affected the Americas bad. And there were always fleets of survivors that left in, a, 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 in America that had been totally ruined for, for other areas of the world. It happened in 3439 B.C., it happened in 2239 B.C., uh, which was 12 centuries later. It happened again in 1229 BC. This was the this was the uh, uh, fall of Troy. There's all kinds of cataclysmic things going on. Sea People's Confederation already knew already knew that the changes in the world were coming. In 1135 BC, the Phoenix phenomenon totally wiped out the Americas. And uh, this is the this is why it also wiped out much of the much of Asia. This is why we had a massive migration of 250 thousand Chinese. In multiple fleets disappear from China and reappear in Central America, and they became the Olmecs. You uh, know, this is why jade has been found, and all these Asi Asian features have been found all throughout Central America. It's because it's because of this massive ancient Chinese migration that occurred. This is why Chinese coolies were here long before Chinese immigration started. This has been a mystery in the Tartaria. A lot of the Tartarian guys have noticed, hey man, San Francisco horror, and all this, well, where are all these Chinese coolies come from? We don't have any records of Chinamen coming, and we don't. And there was some Chinese people coming on, on the little, little uh, boats and stuff over here, but there was already a very large, significant Asian population here, even during all the history of the Native Americans. They were just called by different names. But yeah, the, Chi the Chinese have always had a, or the Asians, East Asians have always had a very significant presence here in North and Central America. But uh, I think that, I don't know if I covered it all, Clay. Um, okay. Oh, let me no, but I, I remember, hold on, let me continue, let me continue. The uh, 2040, 2040 is going to be the wake-up call. When this, when this Phoenix phenomenon occurs... It's going to be a wake-up call. I have a feeling that this chronology that I have put together is going to be widely known all around the world and probably not be taken seriously until the event occurs. And once that event occurs, then people are going to wake up and take it seriously, and they're going to do exactly what Nostradamus predicts. He predicts a massive exodus from Western nations of all these survivors of a cataclysm. Because he predicts two cataclysms, too. And the first one is 2040. It's in his predictions. So. Nostradamus uh, basically paints the picture in his quatrains that there's going to be a massive evacuation of Western nations, and these people are going to go back to the lands of their ancestors' nativity. He's inferring the Middle East. So, uh, and I believe this is going to be because people wake up to the fact that every single whole major lithosphere displacement is 30 degrees. Every single one of them has been 30 degrees. The magnetite shows 30 degrees shifts each time. This is why the Great Pyramid is 30 degrees north latitude right now, when in the ancient world it used to be 0 degrees latitude, 0 degrees longitude. It used to be the dead center of the earth. And I show in my book, Lost Scriptures of Giza, that the common denominator about the Great Pyramid, Mount Meru, the ancient mountain, Mount Zion, whatever you want to call it, it was the same thing. It was always at the dead center of the world. It's not at the dead center of the world anymore. It used to be. It's 30 degrees off now. And the center of motion for the next pole shift will be the Great Pyramid. But even that is going to still move to some degree. But uh, the Americas are going to are, are have it bad in, in, 
in the 2046 event. The 2040 event is not that bad. It's only bad for Asia. You know, that's, what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to understand real quick. That shift you're talking about, that 30 degree shift occurrence, it's 2046 or 2040? Okay, okay I, I understand the confusion now. Okay, the sixth seal of the apocalypse describes a, a pole shift. But it's only a minor one. And we've had several of those. The Phoenix phenomenon has caused at least six of those in the historical record. This is not lithospheric displacement. This is a temporal pole shift. Meaning, meaning the world, and whether you believe it's flat or whether it doesn't even matter, it means the entire stellar sphere is going to move, simulating a pole shift. But it's going to recalibrate and everything's going to be fine and everything's going to be back in its original positions. It's going to move, though. This is not lithospheric displacement. It's going to move 30 degrees. And the land masses are going to slip under ocean, or under seas and oceans, and that's where most of the destruction is going to come from. But everything's going to stabilize until the Nemesis X object. That is a true pole shift. That is a shift that will be lithospheric displacement. That is a shift that will be permanent. And the worst thing about that is that there's no restabilization. Without restabilization, it means all the oceans will take weeks to catch up with the land mass instead of the land mass slipping back to where it's supposed to be. Because in a temporal pole shift, the land masses slip under bodies of water. The bodies of water don't have time to move up. They don't have no time to catch up to it. Temporal pole shifts over very fast. Lithospheric displacement is not. It means that new nations will build their homes on former ocean beds. It means everything is sloshed around and changed. But the safest places to be in the entire world are at, are closest to the pivot. And the pivot, for whatever reason, the Great Pyramid marks that pivot region. It's like a marker for, for all the survivors of all the resets to know this is the safest place to be. You can live anywhere you want in the world, but when these events occur, you better be close to this pivot. Well, will that make the pyramid be pointed up at the Alpha Draconis star again, like when it was built in 1080? Yeah, oh, yeah the, the calculations about Alpha Draconis, that was noticed by Charles Piazzi Smith in the 1880s. And uh, he noticed that it doesn't do that anymore, but he noticed that when the Great Pyramid was in its original position, yes, that shaft pointed straight at Alpha Draconis, but since the fall of the dragon, which was a 30 degree gift, uh, it's no longer pointed that way. So yeah, that's, I didn't even think about that, but yes, that is, that is more evidence that the shift is 30 degrees, because originally Alpha Draconis, the eye of the dragon was the pole star. And it means it's the only star in the sky that doesn't spin. It was, it was an eyeball that stayed open. And then Draconis was the dragon that was wrapping around one third of the stars in heaven. And as the, every night when the stellar sphere, when the whole stellar sphere shifted, one star was right there. And it took, and this is why ancient eight oriental nations, they counted days. What did they call them? They called them dragons. The reason they called them because the turning of a dragon was a day. This is the this is the old stellar calendar. This is even before the lunar calendars. So yeah, that's a good point. That's an excellent, absolutely good point. But the origin of that data comes from Charles Piazzi Smith, the Royal Astronomer for Scotland, who wrote a book about the Great Pyramid in the 1880s. Yeah, I gotta get here. Let me get one last clarification to throw in there just to make sure we got it all in one little bundle here. So leading up to the Phoenix, um, I think you said something about uh, Australia. being. This. So as long as you're not in Asia, basically, keep that into account. And everybody else, like even in Texas and Australia, most people would be good until Nemesis X. Then we really got to um, kind of jump ship, I guess, yeah, or move towards. So yeah, Nostradamus provides more detail, actually, than the Revelation does. He provides a lot more detail. It's just stunning how the, the date index of Mario reading has been proven factual over and over again uh, between these two dates of 2040 and 2046. 2046 is by far the worst one. Australia, after 2040 and 2046, is going to be prime real estate. I think the elite already know this, but it's going to it's be... 
Oh, it's like gonna be, it's gonna be like a Garden of Eden. It's gonna be on the equator, and it's gonna be like a Garden of Eden, and it's gonna, and this is why most of China is gonna be shoved into the Arctic, Mongolia. It's all gonna be, it's gonna be the new Siberia, and uh, we're gonna have problems. And I don't know, I don't know what it's gonna do as far as the home tours of Australia, because much of Australia it is at, is at very high altitude. It's the interior of Australia that's at low altitude. So I don't know. The habitable areas may stay intact just fine. The interior may become a whole new ocean like it used to be. That's why it's all desert. It used to be a sea. But uh, if, if we go by the, topo the, sub the submarine topography of that area of the world, then what we're going to end up seeing is all these old ancient stone cities that are probably buried in coral now coming up to the surface because whole areas of that of the of that area of the world are, are going to emerge much of the pacific wasn't even underwater uh, 2000 years ago and many of those island chains were actually gigantic islands and some of them like southern india used to in very recent antiquity southern india actually was a land bridge that went all the way to new zealand through australia and we know this because the origin of the aboriginals was the dravidians of india this is why dravidian artifacts have been found in, in india this is why the ancient maya concepts of hindu theology is very similar to the aboriginal dream time it's the same people same origin same genetics they even look the same but as the dravidian indians the southern indians the only difference is, is that land bridge cut off all contact, so they had two or three thousand years to develop their beliefs in different ways. Okay, let me ask uh, one more. Should us errants that know kind of what's going on, should we, before the Phoenix, head over there? Are we good? And then, uh, I don't know, like, I, you're saying both is kind of going to happen, and then... Are we supposed to get a safe spot, let it happen, and then we're going to go get on some prime real estate? Okay, look, first of all, preparing for any future event with even a modicum of fear automatically makes you a participant. This is why you don't see the prepper attitude coming from me. This is why you don't hear me talking about building a community and a survival. This is why you don't ever hear me. Well, people ask me all the time, what are you going to do for 2040? I don't really have an answer for that because I am very confident that whatever I need to do is going to be revealed to me before I need to do it. Whatever I need to prepare for, I'm going to see the evidence that I need to prepare for given to me before I need to prepare for it. I, listen, listen, man, I, I don't know how to convey it any more than this, but I have absolute confidence that the Oversoul is going to provide me an exit and a way out for every situation that I find myself in. It doesn't matter if it's unemployment. It doesn't matter if the enemies are knocking at my door. It doesn't matter if it was somebody that I beat the shit out of in prison who gets out of prison and hunts me down and wants some type of payback. It doesn't matter. I'm going to live through whatever experiences by intuition and by guide, guidance from something higher than me. I cannot prepare for a negative without some type of participation in it. Okay. I got that, but aren't we supposed to take into account the knowledge that we... I, I believe not? that. I believe that 100%. Listen, listen, you know, I, I need you to understand. You being knowledgeable about any events that may may or may not happen in the future doesn't make you a participant of it. Okay. But your emotional state about that knowledge will definitely decide your coordinates in that event when it happens. Boom, that's what this I was trying. What, Absolutely. Awesome. Go this, ahead, is sorry. Why I, I, this is why I tell you all the time, we have to we have to discuss these things with pure objectivity. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what our intellectual capabilities are. It doesn't matter some people are smarter than others or retain information more at all. It says we're emotional beings, and it's the emotional attachment to information that decides where we are in proportion to that data. So this is the danger. I'm not going to prepare for a negative, ever. I'm just not going to do it. Yeah, I'm not either. I'm, like I said, I think I said last time in the Discord that I'm just playing the game. That's all I'm doing. I'm seeing myself yeah. in a game, moving the pieces forward to 
all I'm doing is move myself where I think I can be happy in the next future. I don't even care about the Phoenix coming or, or anything like that. I'm not running from anything or I, I just like took everything that you taught, created a reality tunnel, like you said, and this was my breaking pattern on Discord. And it has led me. I, I know all this and everything you said. I was just really trying to get clarification on that, just uh, I mean, that, the two events. Too. That's good too. I get that, but I'm gonna tell you now, Clayton. I'm gonna be that little old lady. I'm gonna cross that street without looking left and right. I'm just gonna do it. So, I feel that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, I appreciate it's, you, listen, brother, for explaining that. I mean, Thank you. I mean, I mean, listen. It's not. There is. There is no position here that I'm trying to advance that I am more important than you, or that I am more understanding than you. The position I'm trying to advance is that we are so powerful that we actually dictate the terms of our existence. And until we embrace that, until we fully understand that all the information in the world cannot affect me, but when we understand that, hey man, you know what? This is all fascinating and yeah, it's some scary stuff and all that, but it's absolutely amazing that I can, I can actually envision a future where I am an observer who fundamental changes of the geography and all kinds of things around me and that the oversoul is so resourceful that it can get me to the coordinates that I need to be in this world to be safe. I can find every haven not by searching for it but by believing a haven will be provided. When you adopt this attitude there is absolutely nothing that you would, you would fear. There's nothing. Because the, the, that fear that fear is going to knit coordinates for you somewhere in the future for you to experience that which is feared. I feel you, brother. I'm, hey, I'm from fully on board with what you've taught and shown all of us. To me, it's just, it was just asking questions and just clarifying on that one. Because I had other people that were like curious on, on that, so I was just trying to put it in this video to to clarify that little thing. But yeah, I'm not worried about anything, <laughs> not one bit. I'm having fun, and that's yeah, what that's all that matters to me. Even if we do survive 2052, the Seven Kings are going to come and rule over us, right? So, okay, you're taking consideration. 2052 is a long time from now. 17 years from now is 2040. All right. Now, none of us know where we are in our spiritual development. We really don't know. Some of us have an idea, but we don't know concretely. This is between us and the Oversoul. Now, we do have this barrier between us because we're jacked into the central nervous system which is controlling this one avatar therefore i'm not attached right now inside the construct to all the other experiences i have experienced in all my other avatars i don't know there's been a memory wipe but like i say all the time memory and information is holographic and being holographic that means it's still out there in the field it's just it's just disconnected from me while i'm in this avatar so i don't know where I'm at right now, and neither do you. But we're in the harvest period now, and have been since 1902. This means that this is the last cycle for a lot of us. We're not coming back. This is why. This is why the sixth seal. After the fifth seal, it's very specific. The fifth seal says there is an area God considered considers it an altar. But there is an area where souls have been sequestered. They have been put into this safe place, and, and they're crying up to God, Hey, man, now's the time, right? Why haven't you revenged us yet? And they're basically told to be patient. And as soon as they're told that, the sixth seal is broken, and this massive temporal shift occurs, and the stars roll like a scroll. The sun darkens, the moon turns red as blood. This is the wake-up call to those who are still here that the apocalypse is about to begin. Because remember, the seven seals are not the apocalypse. They have to, all seven must be broken before the scroll is opened, and the scroll has the contents of the apocalypse. So these seven seals that are all broken, four horsemen and all that, they're not the apocalypse, have nothing to do with the apocalypse. They are a wake-up call to those who are searching for the signs that what's about to unfold is about to unleash. But this is during the harvest. There are people who have already died since 1902 that have not been recycled back in. They're not. 
And some of us, some of you listening to my voice, myself included, may not be cycled in when we, when we pass away. Some of us may pass before in the next 17 years before 2040. Some of us may pass in 2040. Some of us may pass in the, in the chaos that ensues between 2040 and 2046. Although hundreds of millions of us are going to make that migration and we're going to go, to the, we're going to go back to the lands of our ancestors' nativity, probably closer to Egypt, Mediterranean. Some of us will survive that. Now, I'll be 67 years old in 2040. I'll be 73 in 2046. I may survive that. I may die during, during those times, too. And I, I may not recycle back in. But in 2070, that's when the exodus occurs for those who are prepared. That's that small window. It's that small window. That's five? Those, those were right, 2070. Right. So is that, is that, that five point, in the circle, though? You know what? It, you said history is a circle. Would that be five where it breaks off? I don't. I, don't, I, I wouldn't know. I'd have to compare that with with, with everything else. It's a, uh, yeah. You know, I, I, you're you're just gonna have to wait for the Chronicon those to be published on on those on those years after 2046. But uh, yeah, because that's a lot of data. That's a lot of data, and so it's pulled from a lot of a lot of eschatology and and like I said, isometric projections and Nostradamus Erastrian fragments. The uh. But 2052 is when liberty is taken from the earth. It's basically humanity is enslaved. Nothing good is happening after 2052. So during, from 2052 to 2070, everybody else who is still here will be removed. Yeah, remember, there, there are passages even in the biblical record that God takes them to keep them from the evil to come. So from a materialist perspective, we're looking into the future thinking, damn, I don't want to die during these events. But from a spiritual perspective, your death is absolutely necessary for you to partake in that exodus. So, yeah, there's not going to be any, there's not going to be any errants after 2070, and no one who is who is considers himself to be an errant is going to want to be here in 2052. So, uh, these are things I don't really talk about on my channel. I don't go into these details; it's not necessary. The world is going to be a very different place before. You know, there's no reason to entertain that on YouTube. There's no reason for people to go to, the, to that to that because they just they're not ready to wrap their minds around the fact that, that you're not even a material being; you're a spiritual being. Nothing I'm saying is scary. Nothing is scary. This is all a program we're all living out. And we've all and those of us who are going to make our escape is because we've matured. We've learned our lessons. It's time to go on to the next construct. We may go home for a while, for a little bit, and then we're going to go on. But when we look back on this, we're going to realize, man, that was a fun ride. You know what I mean? I might be able to, I'll probably be able to remember every single time I got executed or killed or, or died on a battlefield or did something stupid and blew myself up. Whatever. It doesn't even matter. Because once we're out on the outside of the construct looking in, every bit of this was just an experience. It wasn't real. But uh, remember, we're more beings. We cannot die. There's a real good quote. I can't remember who said it. Vanderman? Helen Vanderman, I believe. There is no such thing as death because an opposite to God does not exist. But, uh, yeah, I'm, that's, that's the best way I can say it. I can, that's the that's a best way uh, I can sum that up. It's uh, from a materialist standpoint, everything about the, the tribulation period, the end times, it's, yeah, it's, it's some scary stuff. But, but we're not really material beings. We just think we are. So, yeah, it's, we're in the harvest right now, and, and it's the best place to be. So, I um, can't remember if I, I don't even know if I've answered all your question yet. I'm really surprised I haven't, I haven't gone on more tangents tonight. Hey, it's an ebb and flow of how the conversation goes, you know? Um. Uh, does anybody have anything else they want to ask? If not, go ahead, Dennis, if you want to go to add and ask real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah I just wanted, to say, just wanted to say a sincere word of thanks, Jason, for uh, gratitude and appreciation for having lived a difficult life in your own way to have amassed all this information and be able to give it to us as, as knowledge and understanding and a word of comfort at this time. And I just wanted to say, do you think that uh, something like this happens in every 7,000-year cycle? Someone like you comes along with technology at the end, you can sort of... Disseminate this kind of information. I believe that uh, I believe that we're living in a program, and that you and I together would be astonished at how repetitive all this is in the collective, and that only minor details in the individuals would are different each 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 time through. That we're on a cycle. That 
It's, 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 it's a part of the design. I do not believe that a perfect eternal oversoul would ever allow something introduced into his creation or her creation that would actually be a problem. I believe that it's only perceived that way. And that's why I believe this is a construct. Because everything is allowed in here. It's a neutral field. And problems were introduced in here so that we could mature as immortal beings. And we get fixated on those problems and we build religious and philosophical systems when actually it's all of human construction. And once humans constructed it, it became a reality within the field. And I believe that hundreds of billions of these simulacrums exist and that, we're, and that we've already passed through multiple ones and we have more to go. And that eventually will be gods over our own creations. But until that happens, we have to inherit that. And to inherit that position, we have to show ourselves worthy of being a co-creator. Because until we fully understand the elements of being a, an actual co-creator, we can never be a creator. According to the Sophia myth, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, there's like the nine iterations of like the 7,000 year cycle. And now Sophia fell into the earth, and we're in the 10th one, and she's going to bump mankind up to 11th. So this is like getting into the evolution, ev elevating mankind as a whole up to the 5th and 6th dimension. I know you don't know, know what, talk much about that, but I'm just curious your thoughts. This was more the realm of, like, Steiner, and on YouTube, you've heard of, uh, like, Gigi Young. Um, these are things that they talk about a lot. I don't want to get into that... Uh, that's also Enochian. It's a it's a very Enochian. The the tenth heaven, the ten heavens, and all that. It's yeah, you're right. I don't really get off into that. It's uh, it's. I'm not saying none of it's true. It's just it's not material I've ever thought. I'm very familiar with it, but it's also all very Jewish to me. The ten cephalo and the ten the ten levels of hell. It's uh, it's just not something I I don't see any application to it. I don't see I, I don't see uh how how it could benefit me to explore any of that because it's it's I don't know it's just it's hard to explain it's 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 beyond my realm of experience because I've read the material I look at it and and it doesn't resonate with me so it's not for meant for me to either know or it's not meant for me to convey because I'm familiar with the material I've read a lot of Renaissance and medieval material that goes into these ten realms ten levels of hell but I just even when I read Helena Blavatsky and she was describing all this, I just couldn't, none, none of it just bounces off of me. I do not resonate with that whole, that whole uh, uh, construct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carmen Doc, did you want to, I'm not sure what you actually asked real quick. What would be the most meaningful thing we could send or do for inmates of our prisons? I'm not sure what you mean there. I like your sense of humor, Edward. I kind of stop at the 47,000 plane of the heavens. That's pretty good. Uh, I mean that, that uh, you know, you can send books or some gifts. I have a few friends that are uh, residents in Texas. And so okay. um, I just wondered if, if you had any ideas on what would be meaningful or um, a good thing to send them, just coming from your, your point of view. Is that Carmen Doc? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm looking for the comment, but I can't find it. But sorry. Okay, there it is. Okay. No, that's a big comment, Carmen, but that's not the one you just said. No, this is so, a rant. What would be, you said what would be the most meaningful thing we could send or do for inmates of our prisons? Is that your question? Yeah, I think that's what she meant. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um. Well, first of all, there's not there's not a whole lot to do in prison but think and exercise. So, uh, there there is a there is a couple books called the Door Lectures. They're very thin. They're very small. Very paperbacks. My publisher, Book Tree in San Diego, actually provides these books, but they're called the Door Lectures on Mental Science. Uh, these are really good books to start anybody on 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 constructing reality. These books are very simple and they break down the world as a construct and how we can use our mind to manipulate circumstances and bring things about you know, into, our, into our experience just by being aware that they are possible to be experienced. I think the door lectures on mental science and Thomas Crowland's books 
Uh, Thomas Troward also has books on the same. He's a judge in 1901, 1902, 1903. He published some books on mental science. These are also provided by Booktree. I love Booktree. They're, they're my publisher, but I love them because the whole time I was in prison, this man had this catalog. He sent me this catalog, and it has over a thousand titles. And over 600 of those titles are books from the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And I just, I, and I just, I ordered as many books as I can. And he sent me some for free, and I had benefactors that would order books and have them sent. So, uh, Paul Tice of Booktree. Uh, but that, those, that's what I would do if I if I, if I was going to be sending any materials to prisoners. It would be the Door Lectures books and Thomas Trollwood's books, which are all in that catalog, and they're all small, easy, easy reads. But they will completely plant seeds in people's mind to want more. And that, that's for that's 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 that's, that's what, about consciously creating the circumstances. That's what I would start them off. But as far as being interested in history or historical things, there is no better series of books to, to really fascinate people than David Hatcher Childress's Lost Cities books. Because this man didn't just publish books about lost artifacts and civilizations and mysteries. He actually takes you into the airports. You, 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 you listen to the conversation, you read the conversation, the dialogue he has with local, local historians and local archaeologists and researchers, or locals who just tell you the traditions about certain areas. This man traveled all over the world, talked to the locals, read the literature from the locals, and tells you all about these places. In every single book of the Lost City series it is a gold mine. It will get anybody interested. This is what, this is what got me to chasing bibliographies. And what I mean is, is when I read a nonfiction book, if I like that book, I'm going to go to the back and I'm going to write down all the books that this man read and researched to get this material, and I'm going to order those books too. So that's that. I'm going to keep it simple. The door lectures on mental science, Thomas Trollwood's books on uh, on mentalism, and the the seven books of the Lost City series by David Hatcher Childress. This is going to wake up any prisoner. When they, when they read this, their mind is going to be on fire, and it's going, to, it's going to start them on the same path that I went through of just self-education, and then they won't even feel like they're in prison anymore. They're just going to sit and read, write, and, and take notes, and, and hunger for the next next book. Thanks a lot. Yeah, um, Childers is a really, really genuinely nice guy, too. Have oh, you met him? Absolutely. Okay, I don't... I'm a, I've never met him. I don't have anything against him. Uh, I, I'm just not really comfortable with the fact that he got in bed with the ancient aliens crowd, but that's okay. I think he got kind of roped into that, to be honest. Well, I, I would agree with you, because the episodes that I watched, his participation is never in the promotion of an alien species. He's basically just giving the facts about different historical places. I think he's uncomfortable, but he did it for whatever reason. Hey, Jason, while we're on that vein, um, I read your book. I like your book recommendations on like physics and like changing our reality. So I've read like Library Chaos. I've read all the Ishtak Bentov, uh, the Gateway Experience. Do you have anything else you could recommend on uh, Awaken the Mortal, of course, but anything else in that same vein that you could recommend? Yeah, I, I can, but um, these, these books have a different focus. But there is a book called Subquantum Kinetics by Paul oh, Violet. Yes. That book is deep, and it's not for everybody. But it's not about changing your reality and all that stuff. That book is about the actual substrate of reality and why the physics constants operate the way they do. It's a much better explanation uh, of the world than what we have in, in, in regular scientific parlance. That book is deep. But if you apply the material in subquantum kinetics of La Violette to what you've already read, then yes, it's, it's going to be very beneficial to you. You're going to understand that this really is a construct and it can be manipulated. Thank you. Awesome, but, awesome. Uh, in, that, in that same vein, I would read everything by Paul La Violette. He, he has a book called Earth Under Fire about cataclysms. In that book, he publishes a series of charts showing uh, all these amazing 
uh, saturations of, of cosmic energy hit the Earth. All this uh, gamma, these gamma ray bursts that came from the sky and saturated Earth. And he has a general timeline of when these occurred. And I've published this in one of my books or one of my videos. One of them, I, one of them I have it where I, I go into detail about these cosmic bursts because they line up very, very close with all the appearances of the Nemesis X object. Awesome. All right, Jason, we're at the three-hour mark. Brother, um, does that anybody else have three hours? That was three that hours. Was three hours? Wow, that quick it was. Wow, is, this gonna, is this gonna appear on YouTube later? This broadcast, well, uh, everything but everything but one little segment where, where I kind of went, I don't know, I might, as long as I didn't mention them, I went off on the Jews a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just gonna I jump in there. Oh, yeah, uh, 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 I was just asking if I could jump into the end there. Yeah, yeah, give me just a second. Let me say uh, Madness right yeah, yeah. real quick. Um, uh, Jason, what do you think about when you put this on your channel, uh, maybe premiere it, and we can all get in the chat and watch it? Or um... You know what? I have never done a premiere before. I'm going to have to have Matt show me how to do that. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that. We can do it as a premiere. Cool. Awesome. Go ahead, Madness. Thank you, brother. No, no, thank you. And I just wanted to say, Jason and Matt and everyone here, um, so I used to study this stuff, but the idea that there's the connections being made here right now um, and everything, again, just so appreciative and grateful, Jason, for you coming in here and for Matt uh, being by your side and Phoenix and Adam and everyone who, uh, you know, helps this Discord. I, I don't know if you will realize, but hopefully they will resonate when they listen to this later and I'm going to re-listen to this myself again, but... There's just so much communication and connection and uh, possibility here, especially when we talk about errands. Um, yeah, strengthen the journey, journey well. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, no problem. I'm all. Uh, this is what I do full time now, so I got a lot more time for it. I just like I said, I want to do the Discord. I want to do the Discord and put the video on YouTube twice a month. So we got we got one of them down. So we need to schedule later on this month when we're going to do the next one. Absolutely. Whenever you and, got uh, time, brother. And sometimes we can even do themes. They don't have to be a general Q&A. If you can come up with a theme where you just want to hyper-focus on one certain or two certain things, y'all come up with that topic and we'll just do that. It doesn't have, doesn't have to be just scattered like it was tonight. We can, it's, uh, we can, we can get creative. Cool. We will. Absolutely. Well, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm open to anything. I, we can talk about all kinds of... Um, I'm the same. Yeah, okay, whatever's, okay. Not, whatever's not YouTube friendly, it doesn't matter. I can edit that out. Right gotcha. We got some beautiful minds in here, so I know we're going to come up with some, some great stuff. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, and thank you. It's great to how do you see, thank you, Jason. How do you, see how many, how do you see how many people are in this chat? How many people are actually listening? That's um, twenty-three currently. Twenty-three. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm just. I'm trying to learn this. This uh, deal because I see. I see. I see the number ninety next to this Phoenix icon on the left in my menu. I guess that's how many people are in the Archaics community. Ninety. Uh, Says so seven hundred twenty-six errands. But seven hundred twenty-six, Jason. I got a little camera. I I got a little camera icon next to a phoenix. A little phoenix. And it says 90 under it. I don't know what that is. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> I'll have to look at it. Do you see the Adam? Do you know what that is? No, I don't know. What I, see. I, put, I put my cursor on it. It says Archaics Community. It shows a little camera icon. And it says 90. In, in a little red, red, red circle. Hmm. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll figure it out. That's all it takes with Discord is a little bit of time. It it is a it can be a little daunting at first, but um that's why I like Discord. It's more of a community feel, you know, like people can come in, we have different chats, it's broken up, you know, you don't have to get confused and like have to go back up and chat and stuff from like some other places. So and it's got the best voice chat. So that was ultimately the reason I chose it.
um, that I wanted to use this platform for this. I knew Discord had the best, where you can just click one button, bam, you're talking to people. What? You don't have to call them or nothing, so. All right. Jason, how was the weather? The weather how was the weather here? in Texas? Yeah. Oh, well, today was beautiful. I should have been on my motorcycle today. Yeah. yeah. The, weather, the weather in the past three or four days has been terrible, but today was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Good. Absolutely beautiful. I'm well. Uh, I'm gonna tell. I'm not gonna be surprised. Uh, Jahar, you sure didn't participate much. You know, no, no, normally, you, huh? Yeah, yeah. And, and Wendy, also Wendy Flores. I can't believe you stayed quiet this whole three hours. I was listening to everything. It was good. Like I agree with you. It's all good shit. Trust me. I was listening. Yeah. All right. All right. Anyway, I went to. I had. And then when I went to unmute myself, I accidentally kicked myself out of the room and then didn't know how to get back in. And then I got back in and then you were like kind of already on something else. So I was like, oh, shit. Well, uh, I, I, I would, Clayton, I'll need a copy of this video. And for those of you who are interested, there's a video of mine that while we were in this chat uploaded to YouTube, it's there now. I'm showing off all, all the new books that have been donated and showing you what's in them. Yep. Uh, Adam, just like last time, will send... Uh, send you his recording, and when I can figure out how to send mine, I'll send it to you too. Okay, well, I just need one recording. You don't, you don't both have to do it. I just need one. Okay. And uh, I know I got Matt opening, Matt starting a file. Uh, call me, Doc. You want to do a video? You want to do a chat? I think yeah, I would, love, I would love to be able to do one with um, just a slant on uh, the history of different aspects of medicine and how it's been obfuscated. Damn. I guess, that, I guess you're going to have to take the floor on that one because I'm not really familiar with all that. Oh, I'm sure you can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, but that's all. Uh, I haven't done that one. Alright, guys. Well, we'll do another three hours sometime later this month. You just got to send me an email and tell me when the best time is. Yes, and uh, I'm going to have Matt shut this down. I don't know Thank, what I'm doing. You. Thank you, Jason. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Jason. Yes. So much. Thank Have you. a good night. I had fun. We'll do it again. Later on, Matt. Good to see you too, Thank brother. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, I'm so glad to be a part of this. Hey, you're welcome to join yeah. us too, man. You're welcome <laughs> to sit you. right here next to him. Night, Jason. Thank you. Good Thank night. you. Good night, night brother. See you later. Later, guys. Hey, John Boy. Hi, John Boy. <laughs> Good stuff. You ready? Yeah. In both the description box and the comment section below, you will find my personal email. Ask me any questions. You have video ideas? I'd like to hear them. And if you want to donate, all those buttons are accessible below. Playlists and everything you might need. Access to the gates to my websites.